We are standing at the corner of Maxwell Creek Road and Rand Road. This was the location of William Sachs' original home. In 1845, he came to this corner and made himself a dugout home. Back in this direction. He lived in the dugout until the early 1850s, at which time he built a rock ranch house and called it the Lone Elm. The ranch house had porches on the east, the east and the south, and had a wide center hallway which led down to those cellar rooms, which Mr. Saxe kept for storage purposes. He used to order uh, his chimney uh, globes by the gross and soda by the keg. After the Santa Fe Railway came through the present part of Saxe, uh, William Saxe moved to town. At that time, one of his sons, Jasper Newton, who was known as Newt, and then formerly lived down Ranch Road, Newt moved into the Rock Ranch House. He lived there until 1912, at which time he tore it down, filling up part of the cellar rooms with the rock from that house. And Newt Saxe built a three-story home with portico shade electricity, and all the amenities of the day in 1912. That house stood until the late 20s when it burned. The present house was built in the late 1920s. This property, owned by William Saxe, went to his son, Jasper Newton Saxe, and is now owned by Jasper Newton's son, Woodrow Wilson Saxe. Directly across Maxwell Creek Road on the corner of Ranch Road was William Saxe's mill and gin. These were horse and oxen powered. In 1869, the oxen powered gin burned and it was replaced with a steam powered gin. William Saxe's great barn was on the next rise toward the north. The barn constructed with heavy beams which were held together by wooden pegs. I have one of the Bodart pegs with me that we can put on camera here. You can imagine the size of the main beam of the barn if this was the peg that held it together. Near the site of that large barn, J.K. Saxe built his first ranch home. Directly across on the west side of Maxwell Creek Road, the eldest son of William and Martha Saxe built his home. He was Daniel Boone Saxe. He lived there several years before he moved west, and at that time the youngest Saxe son, Francis Marion, known as Frank, moved into that, um, into that house. The cellar room still exists at this location. We do still have a bit of history left for Saxe. The cellar room that still exists is under the building behind the main house. It was lined with logs and the original logs are still there. This property, which is William Saxe Survey, joins the Daniel Herring Survey at this point. We will next go see the Daniel Herring Homestead location. I think it's Skyline Acres at 131 Sunset Drive. This was the location that Daniel Herring chose for his home in 1840s. His first home was a log cabin. He lived in it until 1862, at which time he took horses and wagons to Jefferson City because that was the location of the nearest sawmill. He brought back the lumber and erected on this spot a two-story frame house. Its main feature was a very tall chimney. Inside, the fireplace was six feet long and five and a half feet high with an iron board across to hold the cooking pots. The barn and house area were defined by some of these trees. 
the Daniel Herring Survey of 640 acres met the William Saxe Survey that we have just seen. Joshua Lawrence Herring, eldest son of Daniel Herring. When Josh married in 1875 to Kibbe Ann Kirby of the Liberty Grove community, he took this location for his home. This was originally built by Daniel Herring as a house for hired help. At the time that Josh married and moved here, he remodeled and incorporated the outside kitchen room into the main house and added massive pillars where front posts had formerly existed on the porch. In 1888, April 1st, on the birth of his third daughter, Josh transplanted this cedar tree to this spot. The early settlers had timber down in Muddy Bottom, and this was brought from the acre that he bought for timber. The house that's presently standing has been here since 1949. The original 1870s house was torn down at that time, but all the lumber from that house is incorporated in this house. There are solid wood ceilings, solid wood walls throughout. There is also a small barn to the north and the west that is built from 1870s barn lumber. We are now in the process of restoring it and plan to do further restoration on this house. I think the family's gone to... <laughs> we are at mailing address 5720 Alexander. This location originally was the home of DeWitt Clinton Saxe, who married Susie Herring, daughter of Daniel Herring. They built in the 1890s a fine two-story neoclassical home on this spot. The house was later bought when D.C. and Susie went to West Texas by Missouri Saxe Ingram. This was 1970, and she lived here until her death in 1942. The original house was torn down. The house presently standing here was built by her daughter and husband. This was Lily Ingram Saxe, I'm sorry, Lily Ingram Salmon, and the property is now in the estate of her son, Brian Salmon. Main road down. When were these streets uh, put in here? Anthony Street? Uh, not, not Anthony, but... Uh, and everybody got presents every Christmas, every birthday. Oh. Well, I tell you, I wish I were... On the rise, beyond this gate, where the taller trees are, 
was the home of Martha Herring Macaimus, daughter of Daniel Herring. She built a two-story frame house similar to her father's that we saw earlier in Skyline Estates. However, her front porch pillars were two-story with an open gallery across the front. Martha was famous for her spinning wheel, which she kept in the parlor. And until her death in the 1930s, she would demonstrate for school children. We are on Ben Davis Road, north side, about one mile east of Rallet Creek. Bunker Hill Road between Ben Davis Road and Highway 78. Immediately east in this area was the home of James Alfred Saxe. He was called Jimmy and was the son of William Saxe by his first marriage to Elizabeth McCullough. This was probably one of the most beautiful locations in Jimmy's day. A lovely pastoral area. Stand the trees to the north to the south. His home was a two-story white frame with a wide front, front veranda and tall white pillars across the front. This is no longer family owned. We are standing on the corner of 2nd and DeWitt. The address at this house is 5937 DeWitt. Right along with William Saxe's first home and Daniel Herring's first home, this one, this location would be next in line as a historical site. In the 1880s, C.T. Curley, an early merchant, came here and put in a general store and built on this spot a two-story Victorian. He stayed only a short while and sold the house to the Samuel Balkman family. Mr. Balkman was a son of the Balkman family in Dallas for whom Balkman Lake is named. Mr. Balkman sold the house to Missouri Saxe Ingram. She, in turn, sold the house to her brother, J.K. Saxe. J.K. and Molly Saxe moved here in the early 1900s. Molly Saxe was the eldest granddaughter of Daniel Herring. You can see how the Herrings and the Saxes have intermarried during the generations. The house in 1925 was remodeled into a 12-room prairie-style showplace home. There was slate roof, porte double stairways, double fireplaces, what seemed like acres of hardwood floors, a basement with a thermostatically controlled furnace that provided central heat to all rooms, a complex water system with bathrooms on both levels of the house, and electricity was generated on the spot. The first lighted Christmas tree in Saxe was at this house. That house stood until the late 1960s when it was demolished and the present house was put here. It is the home of Iona Perry Ingram. She is the granddaughter of Daniel Harry and the daughter-in-law of Missouri Saxe England.
formerly known as Railroad Street. It's only been given the name Floyd Street in recent years. When William and Martha Sachs' family was grown and the railroad had come through, they decided to move to town into a smaller house. Mr. Sachs told his son Jake, I intend to sit on the porch and watch the trains go through. I imagine that was an awesome sight when only a few years earlier this had been open prairie with itinerant Indians and buffalo and bear. The house was small. It was a brick Victorian with a slate roof and plaster ceiling and walls. All that we have left is a few sections of which was wrought iron. This information is given by Mary Eileen Jones, author of Saxe Remember, and is taken from chapters one and chapters two of Houses Remember. Sorry, I'm on the line. Okay. And the camera's over there, so okay. and you can look at me and look at them, it doesn't make a difference to it. Okay, I'm Eloise Bailey. And I was born just a few miles out of Saxe, Texas. And at the age of an early age, we moved to West Texas. My family did. We lived, moved out there on a big farm out of Rice, Texas. And we lived out there for seven years. And at the end of the seven years, we moved back to Saxe, Texas. And we moved from uh, Bryce by wagon to Clarendon to store ourselves our, uh, merchandise and our livestock that we had on trains to move it to Saxe, Texas. And they were unloaded out here on the railroad, right here in the Saxe home place. Miss Betty, what year was that? But it was in about 1919, as well as I can recollect. Yeah. Did your family own, uh, uh, of course, they didn't own automobiles or anything, did they? No, we got our first automobile when we lived in uh, in uh, Bryce, Texas. We lived right out in the big middle of a, about 100 acres of land or maybe more. We worked this land. And we got our first car while we were there. And it was a, a Model T. But every time we got ready to go to town or go anywhere, we'd have to push the car maybe a mile before we could get started. <laughs> My daddy would jack up the back wheel. Uh -huh. You seen him where they'd yeah. back up, jack up the back wheel and start it? Start well, that's he'd do it that way sometimes. Sometimes we'd all just push it. Of course, there's good many other children to do it. And But when we got ready to move, they moved our stock to Clarendon and shipped it by rail. And it was unloaded. Our furniture and everything was unloaded out here at the track. You see, we did have two uh, uh, depots here. We had a depot in a stockyard, what we had. But we had a good sized depot right out here. And our stock and everything was unloaded right there at our house because we lived there in the, at the Saxe home place that Grandpa Saxe built. His second home place. And while we lived at West Texas, we had, we had lots of fun because we walked three miles to school. And lots of times coming home would become a sandstorm and it almost cut your legs in two from the sand. And sometimes, one day it came a big hail storm and we barely got in the house before the hail started. And when it hailed out there, it was big hail. And all the time we lived out there, we, we made our own living. We had cows and hogs and, and uh, raised beans. My daddy would plant big patches of pinto beans and white beans and gardens and then we would put, the, put it up and, and I'd say all we had to buy was our flour and our meal. And we'd generate our meal from the corn. Yeah. Well, why did you come back to Saxon? Well, my daddy just got tired of farming, I guess, and he decided he wanted to move back in this area. Uh -huh. And so, of course, my grandmother and them all lived here, you see. We was the only one that was out west. But we did have two uncles that lived out there, Uncle Boone and Uncle Frank Saxon. They lived about three miles from us, and we had them to visit while we were out there. And Grandma Saxe came and visited us while uh, about, I guess, about three years before we came back, or maybe years before, before she died. And she spent the night with us one night. And so that's the only time I ever remember seeing Grandma Saxe. Do you remember any impressions as a little girl when you came back to Saxe? Uh, what were your first 
feelings and what we were thrilled to death to live in a town where you could walk to the store and get a coke or an ice cream cone and they uh, was always putting cars out when well, we played in those box cars and we'd go out there every time they put in some new ones sometimes they'd have different things that they loaded in it and sometimes it was sweet and sometimes oats and sometimes ice just different things and we just had a lot of fun. We'd go out there and switch up them cars and play in them. And we'd go over to the stockyard there where they had it fixed where they loaded stock. That was right across the, the road over there, okay. Third Street. And uh, we had a lot of fun doing that way. And of course, we walked to school, and the school was up here on the, what road is that? The Saxon Street. Here. Saxon Street. Anyway, the school was that thing. We just had a little ways to see to walk to school when we could run home for dinner. And, uh, of course, we always wanted to get back because we had papers, you know, that we was out in the yard and play. Did you start school there in the first grade? No, I was in the fourth grade when we moved back here. I was 12 years old when we moved back here. Okay. And uh, I was in the fourth grade. And uh, I never will really forget my teacher's name. Her name was Beatrice Flynn. And she taught me through two. And one thing that outstands very mostly in my mind while she was teaching me, we got to write notes, and all you girls got to write notes to one another, and uh, she called us. And she said, now I said, if y'all, if I catch anyone doing that again, said, I'm going to you. So, well, of course, dancing as we were, well, we got caught again. So she said, well, there's too many of you quit. Well, she made a great big sign about that big, and she wrote, We are sweet sweeties. <laughs> and uh, Paul McCormick was a big, tall boy, and she made him hold that sign in the middle. And I saw her walk out on the walk at recess, and everybody standing looking in the Greek here, did you know there's no sign, uh, sign we're sweet sweeties? <laughs> <laughs> so we all said we'd rather shoot a whip us. <laughs> that too have done that. And then we had a uh, uh, two-story, you see, we had one place upstairs. And when it come time for the bell, the pre teacher would get so enthused with talking that he'd forget to ring the bell. So uh, Alice Bailey, she was my husband's sister, she'd get up and ring the bell. Well, the teacher thought the one below rang it, and the one <laughs> below was one to stop me. So we had a lot of fun that way. Well, now you're talking about a different school building though than what's it's up there now. Well, we went to school. No, yeah, it's yeah, it, 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 They tore that down right after I went to school there until I was uh, 16. And then oh, I see. Uh, it was a wooden, a big wooden building. It was wooden. I have a picture of it here. Okay. Uh, the, um, the the president, was it, was it uh, located on the site where the present old school building where is? The building, where that building is now. Uh, so they tore that one down and built this one. They built, uh, well, they built one other one. It was a red brick, and then they tore it down and built this one. Uh -huh. So this is the third. So, so it was a high school as well. I mean, you went all the way through uh, public education. They went to here. the, yeah, you know, they did with the, the oldest one, but then they had to go to Byron after they got to the 10th grade, I guess, mm -hmm. or somewhere down there. About how many children were there in the school when you were there? Well, there was a good many because they had first grade and uh, second grade and the third and the fourth. They had they had several classes, so they were several. Several went to school there. They had a pretty good bunch of kids. Yeah. And of course, they all lived around here. What kind of uh, social activity did you children have? As children, what, well, I, I'm sure families must have gotten together. What, what did we you did do? well when we was going to school. We had a, you see, there was three stories in that building, and they had a bell, then tower where the bell was at on that there. But you could go up on the third story. We had steps that went up there. Well, we'd go up there at dinner, and we swept it all out, made us a place where we could go up there, and we'd go up there and just sit and talk and, you know, have a good time. And then they had plays. Our school would get up plays, and we would put on plays. And I, one thing that's real outstanding, we put on was putting on a play one night in the the building caved in the upper story. Oh. So 
didn't quite scare, but it didn't hurt any bad. And outside of that, and of course our church, we and most of our activities when I was growing up, you went to school and you went to church, or you went to the cotton patch. <laughs> so that was what we spent most of our time. Because my daddy believed in doing ours, and then everybody else's that didn't get theirs done. And it didn't rain, and we couldn't use a hoe, well we pulled it. You know, we'd pull up yeah. the weeds, we'd go a suck of the corn, or we'd pull up the big weeds on the end. And, uh, and by the time we thought we was going to get to go to school, well, uh, somebody come along and us to come and hold out their crop, or if it's picking time, pick their crop. And my daddy said, well, girls, we better do it, because we may need that money to eat. Well, we would go do it, but you know, none of us kids ever fell to grade. We always made our grade, even though we missed, I guess, sometimes I think two months, a bit of two months of school, but then we always made our grade. What was your favorite subject in school? I believe arithmetic. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite. I was done pretty good. But I, I quit school when I was 16 years old and got married. So. Well, tell us about that. About, <laughs> about getting married and all that. Well, I, um, I was just 16 and so we decided we'd get married. We didn't have no place to go and no money either. That shows you how people's minds used to work in that time. <laughs> But anyway, we got married, and my daddy's mother said, well, y'all can stay here with us till you get your place to live. So we uh, we lived here two weeks, and uh, Mr. Means that used to live up here on the hill, that's that summer's daddy, he wanted my husband to work for him, and so he gave us a little two-room house to live in, and so we bought us a little bit of furniture and, and moved up there, and we, I guess we stayed up there about two years. And, uh, you know, as there was always work, cotton to chop or cotton to pick. Mm -hmm. That's the way we made our living. Mm -hmm. We would get out and work, uh, like for the, through the summer, you know, whenever there wasn't, if there wasn't any work, well, we bought our groceries on the credit. Mm -hmm. The little stores out here were Jenna Davis, and then the minute we got to hoeing or, or picking cotton, which had one was, then we went and paid our grocery bill. And, and generally when we was working, we would buy up everything we thought we would need for the few months that we wouldn't have work. Mm -hmm. And we never did have a worry, I don't guess, we never thought nothing about whether we'd eat or not because we had a good dad-in-law and mother-in-law that they lived here, here's where they lived. And they had a big garden, they had fruit trees and every kind of tree you could think of and he always killed two big hogs and had a milk cow. So we knew when, as long as they had food, we had it, so. And they all seemed, always seemed happy to have us, regardless if we all come at once or whatnot, they was happy to have us. We were just, you know, it was just a happy family. Mm -hmm. And, of course, my mother and Emily and lived over here in the brick house, and uh, then my dad and all them lived here. And uh, now he bought this, Mr. Bailey bought this place. The This house was built for the bank president, they had a bank here in Saxon, and uh, it was built for the president of the bank. And I think he lived here about three years, and then the bank went busted, and so they sold this place to Mr. Bailey, my dad and mom. And he gave $3,000, is what he gave for this block of rent. Of rent. But there wasn't nothing on it but the house. No bathroom. They had a bathroom built, but nothing in it. No cabinets, no water in it, no nothing. Okay. It's just a house. Okay. But uh, what other businesses were there in Saxe back, uh, let's say, in the early days? Well, when we waiter. first came, there was a, there was a barber shop and a post office, a grocery store. I think we had about, sometimes we would have two grocery stores. But then sometime maybe one would close up and another one come. And we had the blacksmith shop. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a picture in the paper of the how the town looked. I don't know whether y'all ever seen it or not. And the book that uh, the Saxes put out. I think Little Pat has my book now. But sometime you could get it and look at that picture if you want to see it. Did, uh did you make trips into Garland or some of the, or McKinney, other cities for supplies or things like that at any time? Everything's pretty well 
self-sustaining. No, when we lived here, I guess we just bought out what we eat here. Mm -hmm. You know, the little stores would pay us, and so we generally just bought out what we had to eat. Of course, we raised a lot of it. Uh, my daddy and mom raised the big garden, and of course, we always helped him with the garden and the, and the gathering it and all, and helped put it up. So they always divided with us. So we we lived pretty cheaply, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, there wasn't really nothing to go to. What, um, what about the Depression? Uh, how, how did that affect people who lived in Saxon? Well, it affected us very much, and I guess it affected some more than others. You see, we were doing, we were working day labor was the way we was done. We didn't have no land, you know. Uh, and we worked for just day labor, and my husband worked for the gym. When the ginning season started, well, he didn't work at the gym and worked out the other guy's jobs, you know, that he could get. But, um, uh, really there wasn't too much, too much work to be done. Mm -hmm. You know, you just couldn't get work. That's why I say people are so lucky now that you can get work. Mm -hmm. And I know the year that the depression was so bad, we picked cotton for 35 cents a hundred, and you would have to make three or four rounds before you'd have enough to weigh. There wasn't no cotton. The bow weevils had eaten it up. Yeah. And uh, that year it was pretty bad because, you know, you didn't have the work. There wasn't no cotton to pick. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but we always seemed to live. And I guess I always heard where this will of his way. So I believe the Lord takes care of you. If you do what you can do, I think you'll do the rest. Yeah. yeah. Well, it seems like that. Folks in those days were probably living off the land more than the rest of us have an opportunity yes. to do now. So you the people that had their own land did pretty good. You see, yeah. my my daddy and my owned a hundred acres over here on Bailey Road. Yeah. He owned that hundred acres, and of course he got the rent you see off of that. But uh, that's how he lived. And uh, but uh, we had to do day labor. Mm -hmm. But my husband would pick up jobs. You know, someone maybe he'd drive a truck somewhere to pick up some onion slips or something like that. There was always some little something you'd pick up a job for. Yeah. Make a little. Yeah. Do you remember uh, some of the earliest modern conveniences when they came in? What, let's say like radios. Did, did they have radios when you were a little girl? Did you all have radio? We didn't know what a radio or fan was. I fanned them in the night all night long. <laughs> <laughs> it froze to death in the winter time. We didn't burn fires in the winter time when night come or when the fires went out and you made it cover to stay warm. And the same way, there wasn't no radios and there wasn't no fans, but I remember the first radio we got. It was a little bitty square about this long, made out of metal, I guess, and had some little uh, bars or some way or another you took and put together. Mm -hmm. to get your music. A probably a crystal. Yeah, that's radio. what it was, just a little. And that was our first one. And I know I even went for it when we got the first one, you know, where it was in a little cabinet. And we thought we was really in high cotton then. We would always uh, lay in bed on Saturday night and listen to the Big Big Jamboree. <laughs> listen to music. So that was, it was several years before we had that. So then you come on still more, a few more conveniences, you know, and and you learned them whenever you got those conveniences to enjoy them. We used to do our washing on the rug board. It would take you a half a day to wash your clothes, and then maybe a half a day to iron them. We ironed everything, and then maybe another half a day to scrub the floor because we had wood floors sometimes. <laughs> yeah. uh -oh, okay. And we lived, we lived in some houses that we, uh, the wallpaper looked so bad that we papered it with newspapers and we could lay in the bed and, and read the funnies and read the papers. <laughs> come in, come in. Uh, what about gas? Uh, did, uh, of course, natural gas hasn't always been in oh, town no. and I'm sure that changed the town quite a bit. Yeah, People began to hook up the gas. Yeah, it changed it while I did, we didn't take it here until we had already had new things. So my husband wouldn't take it because he thought the butane was the cheapest. But after he passed away, well, I had natural gas put in because I didn't like that. I'm coming in and filling my tank. I didn't know when to fill it. 
and so I just changed the natural gas it was cross road so we enjoyed it and then of course when we got electricity we didn't have no electricity you know for a while and uh, they wanted this house for electricity of course we just had a little bulb hanging down that you pull the string you know and it come on and uh, so then went on then later well we bought the refrigerator that uh, box out there on the porch with my daddy-in-law's then ice box mm -hmm. that big long box they would fill it up with ice and that's where they kept their things where they didn't mm -hmm. so it's um, one other area that we hadn't talked very much about is the churches. What about uh, tell well, us about the what was which was the first church here and the uh, Christian church was the first one. The first one when we came here, I think they had another church somewhere before this one. But anyway, when I we moved back here with this Christian church, it was setting that up here in City Hall, and uh, that's where we went to church at. See, we lived in the brick house over there, and we'd go right up that little trail. We landed some trail right on up to the Christian church. And that's the only place we had to go to was church. We had prayer meeting on Wednesday night. And on Christmas, they would get up a little place, or we'd have little programs, you know, for, for uh, Christmas. And we had little things like that that we went to and enjoyed. And, but if you didn't want to go to church, well, and my family you just didn't go nowhere because they didn't believe in going dancing and things like that. Well they just that was just out for us because they wanted us to go to church and so if you said you didn't want to go, well you didn't go nowhere. But we had neighbors. We had a neighbor that lived over here where the corner store is now. Mm -hmm. The name was Corners. And they had a bunch of girls, you know, women. Some of them was older than we were. But on nights that we all wanted to get together, we would walk over there and we'd get out. Of course, nobody would travel down that road now that's there now where people go all the time, you know, cross road there. But we'd all get out there on the side of the road and tell uh, uh, ghost stories. Or we'd chase the, uh, what do you call them, lightning bugs. Yeah. We'd get us a jar and catch lightning bugs. Bugs. And we had that way, you know. We had, we had the entertainers you make your, make your own entertainment. We made our own entertainment out. because they wasn't, uh, occasionally they'd have a party, you know, for the young people. And occasionally on, uh, on some Sunday nights or on Saturday nights, well, uh, we had a pie at our house and they would all group in at our house and we'd have a thingy. And uh, there was just one thing that Mama would not allow and that was no cards in her house. I know they was going to play a little game one night that you had to, Use dice, and she stripped us out it right quick. Nobody got no cards and no dice in her house. <laughs> <laughs> what are I know as a young younger person, you probably had dreams. What are some of the dreams that came true, and what are some of the dreams that just never materialized? Well, I guess I guess I've been pretty fortunate having my dreams all the time true. Of course, I think every young girl wants to get married, and of course, I married my husband when I was 16 years old, and he was 22. And of course, then in, we married in 1924, and then in 1925, our first child was born, and we had two children then, and uh, two boys. One of, them, one of my oldest sons passed away, he's not living. And I don't know, we always seem to be a you know, we just took what come. Of course, we had a lot of spells of sickness. And a lot of times that, you know, we had distress and kind of worried, but it always worked out, you know. We always come through it. My husband had kidney stones all his life, so that was another mm -hmm. problem that we had. But we always, we always tried to take care of the other one when one was sick or the other one was there, you know, to take care of them. See that they got to a doctor and got you know, took care of, so, mm -hmm. and, uh, of course, we got our first, our first car we got was a model, model A, I guess, and, uh, it was, you know, it was good for us, but it was just a one-seater, and we had two children, but anyway, we made do with it, and we enjoyed it, 
And then we finally traded it off and got another uh, Model A, which was uh, had two seats in it. And I guess that was about, about my most disappointing time. My oldest son wrecked it. They, him and some more boys was going to see which one to go around the corner the faces. He turned it over and tore the car up. So, but it still was drivable, so we still drove it anyway like it was. <laughs> But I had a, I had a good life. I, I had, as I say, I had two children. I have twelve grandchildren, and I have uh, eight great grandchildren. And my youngest son's still living. He lives up at uh, Hatchboro. And uh, but we had a lot of good times. I married when I was 16, but a lot of people say, well, we better marry that young when it's too young. But I said, I didn't know what it was or not. I had my children when I was young, and I enjoyed them when I was young. And then I didn't go to work until they was up where I could go to work. And then I went to work for 32 years at Byron and Cat Factory. So <clears throat> that was about the extent of it. But we, we had a real good life. Ms. Bailey, we sure appreciate you taking time. Uh, I have one question. You were mentioning the ice box. Where did you get your ice from? Was there an ice rail? We had someone that hauled it. Where did they get it around here? They got it gone. In Garland. Was there an ice house or was there ice caves? Yeah, they had an ice house in Garland. And they hauled it and the truck come along and delivered it to you. And, you know, everybody that wanted ice, they, you know, they let them know when they wanted it. And they, they generally had the route that they made, you know, every, every other day or every mm -hmm. so often, mm -hmm. and they delivered your eyes. What and other, and what other, other kind of deliveries did you have out here? It was pretty good. I mean, what other kind of things were delivered besides just ice? Was there milk or most people raised their own milk cows, I would imagine, right? We didn't have too much of that in the earlier years, I don't think. And I don't think they really have too much back now. You know, most people go to the store now and get it. But I never will forget that one time. We was working in the field and we were real hot. We lived over here on, uh, I don't know what road they call that now. Anyway, it's uphill to it, you know. You have to go right straight up the hill. So one day we was wanting ice so bad and it was hot and we wanted some ice tea for dinner. And we said, well, we should catch the ice, man. We sure would like to have some ice. So, well, when we got in the car and went home to dinner, when we got, just before we got to our house, there lay a big block of ice in the middle of the road. <laughs> it was a 50-pound a block of ice laying right in the middle of the road. See, when the ice man went up the hill, he lost it. <laughs> and we sure did enjoy that <laughs> ice. Huh? We said, that is... <laughs> That was really good that day, you know, we got that ice. Thought the, the Lord was really looking out. Yeah, the Lord was looking at us that day. Good ice tea. Miss Bailey, we sure do thank you for taking time to share Well, I hope I gave you what, you know, what you wanted. Yeah, it's been good. And I think that, uh, you know, I hear people talk about the good old days, and I'm yeah. not sure whether those are the good old days or not. Well, but, you know, uh, it's, uh, the time is just what you make out of it. I know we had a lot of things that come, you know, in our life. We, our youngest son had the group real bad. And many a night it looked like he would choke to death. He'd be just as well as he could be and lay down and go to sleep and then wake up choking to death. And, uh, of course, we finally got a hold of the doctor, the doctor that gave us something that the minute he took it would give him in it out of his throat. And then my husband had, he had to have surgery, he had a, appendix operation, and then he had to get his own, and then all down through the years we had all these things happen, but we always come to him. I said, you look and see where the Lord was so good that he uh, he met our needs, and I said, we didn't worry nothing about what was going to eat and what was going to work, because we always seemed to have something. And uh, I said, I don't know, I think if you get out and do what you can do yourself, and if, if you're able to work, well, you, now you can find work. But then there wasn't so much to be had. But anyway, we all Amen. made it. Amen. We made it, and we. I can say one thing that we did have a good. My daddy-in-law, mother-in-law, was really wonderful people. 
and he was well known here in the town circuit because he he would always tell you, I know one day he told me, he said, now at least one of these days you're going to be taxed to death. Well, to me, I thought, well, now that's the foolishest thing I ever heard tell of, me being taxed when I haven't even got a penny to my name. He said, well, okay, he said, you know, not, not right now, but said, eventually you'll be taxed to death. And he told me so many things like that, you know, that would, would happen later on, and of course he was right. He was a pretty smart guy. He wasn't highly educated, but he could take the figure of Bill of Lumber and Bill of Ass, and he was a carpenter. Mm -hmm. And, you know. A lot of common sense. A lot of common sense. Mm -hmm. There was wonderful people. Yeah. I couldn't have married any more wonderful people than me. Oh, that's wonderful. They, uh, they loved their family, and their family all loved them. Mm -hmm. We all enjoyed it. Where did you have to go for medical care, medical attention? Did you go to McKinney, or did you go to Dallas, or Went to, uh we had a doctor we went to in Garland, Dr. John Ryan. I don't guess he's yes, been dead for years. Yes, ma'am. I went to Dr. Ryan myself. Did you? He mm -hmm. was our family doctor. He was mine. And my husband would take a kidney stone, and when it hit him, we had to get him somewhere right then. And we would go to Dr. Ryan, and Dr. Ryan was always so gracious. He would come and give Levi a heavy shot of morphine in the vein until we could get him to his doctor in Medical City in Dallas. And we would take him down to Medical City in Dallas. And Dr. Shannon at Southwestern was his doctor. And that's where we made it to. And he had to have surgery one time. He had it at Medical City for kidney stones. They lodged in the tube and they had to operate on it. And then we went to call and he died. And, and we died here at home, but they took him to normal hospital. He'd been in that little heart attack. Okay. We, we went to call and mostly. That's great. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to the first annual Saxe Founders Day celebration. I'm Pat Boyd. I'm the president of the Saxe Historical Society. For those of you who don't know, the Sexy Historical Society is in its first year. We began about April of 1989. To the purpose of uh, the Historical Society is to preserve the history of Sexy as it has been, as it continues to develop throughout our city. For all of those who live here now and those who are to come, so they will know where we have come from and where we're going. Uh, where we've come from is a whole lot easier than where we're going, but we're going <laughs> to try to get all that down too. Uh, this anniversary, uh, Founders Day, coincides with when William Saxe came to this area in January of 1845. There's some, there's some little known facts that some people don't know about it. William Saxe arrived in this area on January 15, 1845. For a few years in the 1890s, Saxe was spelled S-A-X-I-E, and it was listed that way on the turn of the century. I think they changed it back close to the turn of the century. Lumber for the first two houses in this area had to be hauled by wagon from Jefferson, Texas. William Saxe built the first cotton gin in this area, powered by oxen. He built a steam-powered gin in 1869. One of the cellar rooms built in the 1840s by William Saxe for his first home still exists today. In the early 1900s, Saxe had a three-story school complete with music and elocution classes. So we have had some education of our own over the period. <coughs> the first bank in Saxe was established in the early 1900s. The bank was located where the first Saxe Center Shopping Center is on Highway 78 now. In the 1890s, Saxe had its own train depot. The depot was large enough for such a was large for such a small community. It was complete with a ticket window, waiting room, and the convenience of persons having four daily trains. The Saxe postmark existed for more than 50 years. The postmark disappeared with the demise of the post office in Saxe in the early 1940s. We have recently just received our own zip code, so we're on the way to hopefully getting our post office or postmark back. Wild bear, buffalo, and hostile Indians occupied this area when William Saxe arrived in 1845. So it was quite a virgin land when he got here. <clears throat> in fact, bears ate the first pig brought here by William Saxe. So those are a few of the facts that uh, 
that we kind of lose sight of in this modern day and time. But uh, today we're here to kind of celebrate the, the history of Saxe, and we've got three people who have graciously accepted the opportunity to speak, and they have different areas of points of view of the development of the history of Saxe. And they will speak from their own experiences. It's all ad-lib, whatever they thought was appropriate to speak. I don't even know what they're going to speak about, but I'm sure it will be their personal insights and development of Saxe. Uh, I'll introduce all three names, and then I'll introduce them individually. We have Cleo Hudson, who was a longtime resident of Saxe, moved here when she was a small child in the mid 19 teens. Mr. C.L. Davis, who came here in the late 60s and was mayor in the uh, late 60s also, and was instrumental in some of the uh, modernization of the city services. And Joe Stone, who's been a very long time resident of the area, born and raised here, and started the fire department as fire chief for a number of years. So they each have some individual credentials that allow them to give us some insight. First, I'd like to call on Ms. Cleo Hudson to come up here and give us her rendition of how she sees Saxe and its development. Ms. Hudson. Well, Mayor Lane asked me first to make a little talk on the early days of Saxe. My response was no. But being the sweet person she is, I soon reversed my no to a yes. But it was without any, any pressure on her part. And our memory seems to deteriorate sometimes with age. I think I'm in that category. So I began to write my brain and came up with a few things about the early parts of Saxe that I have written. With my parents, I moved to Saxe at an early age. Saxe was a small community town, very little transportation. A lot of walking, narrow dirt roads, more like an attic. I remember a church, a school, cotton gin, and a depot. I don't remember much about the business part. I do remember a store and a blacksmith shop. Occupation was farming. Saxon Christian Church was a frame building <coughs> excuse me, that was just opposite of this building with outdoor plumbing. I grew up in the church starting in the Sunday school as card class. I can remember going to revivals in a wagon with my parents and some neighbors. The revivals were held on the outside of the church at night with plank boards to sit on. This church that was torn down and the present church that now sits on, the, it's located on Ben Davis Road uh, is where we, the Christian church now is. And, <coughs> and I might add that the, that land was donated by Jim and Elsie Barker to build that church on, and the land originally born, was uh, owned by Jim's granddaddy, Uncle Jimmy Saxe, which was the oldest son of the Grandpa William Saxe. I think I have that right. <laughs> and I'm, I'm still, I'm proud to say that I'm still a member of the Saxe Christian Church and attend services regularly. The school was a three-story frame building located on DeWitt Street. There were large cold heaters for heat, outdoor plumbing. The rooms were large. I believe there were only three teachers to teach the entire student body. They, there were a lot of children. Some walked several miles to school. I can remember walking to school and when it was very cold, we would wear see-through scarves over our face. When we got to school, our scarves were frozen from our breath. We carried our lunch in brown paper bags, lunch pails, which were used as surf buckets. I think some also carried their lunch wrapped in a newspaper. The cotton gin I remember was located on Saxe Road across from where I now live. Where, where I now live. I, I then lived on Billington across Saxe Road with my parents. The gin burned on a late Saturday afternoon. That ended the cotton gin. Saxe, that, However, that wasn't the only jam. That, that was the last jam. There were two others earlier. I don't remember either of them. The depot was located across the railroad from the now Chinese restaurant. I guess the depot was torn down. Torn down. A, a later date, two large onion sheds were built. One where the depot stood, the other across 3rd Street. 
Both sheds were destroyed by a tornado, not the same year, but one year apart. I can also remember a large one-room building that stood across Saxon Road from her, where my, from my home now. It was a school and a church. School during the week and church on Sunday. Methodist and Christian. L later, the Methodists went to Pleasant Valley uh, to build a church, the Christian built where I have already mentioned. A family lived in that building when I remember it. Dr. Lyons tore that building down and built the house that still stands where David and Skid Sherry Rowan now live. So we had a doctor in Saxe back then. Some later years, I was, as I was growing up, there was a bank, a post office, and Oddfell and Rebecca Lodge also held their meetings in Saxe. Later, there was a barber shop here and other business buildings. I'm a charter member of the auxiliary to the Saxe Farmers and served as president for two years. I'm now a charter member of the Saxe Senior Citizen Go-Getters. Last year, I was nominated by the Go-Getters to run in the also Great Grandmother Contest at the Fall Fest Country Fair. You know what? I won. <laughs> <laughs> I was proud and, uh, and, and presented a trophy. I waited 81 years for that. <laughs> I, so I have, can say that I have grown I, can, I have, have seen Sacta grow from the horse and buggy days until the present. I, I love Sacta and I'm proud to be a lifelong citizen. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Hudson. I'm sure everybody enjoyed this speech. Now I'll bring up the podium of Mr. C.L. Davis. Uh, as I spoke earlier, he moved here in the late 60s and was mayor during the late 60s. At that time, I think quite a few of the city's improvements have, have occurred. And we appreciate Mr. Davis coming to share that with us. Mr. C.L. Davis. <laughs> the things I'm going to talk about appear 22 years ago. I was not here, as Mrs. Hutton mentioned then. But I could be very specific. On Saturday the 17th, on Saturday, September the 3rd, 1967, I moved into my home on Bonanza Drive. That, oh, I, I pioneered Bonanza Drive. The wheat was about this tall. Mr. Skinner owned that property and they built a house and I moved in before it was completed. While the late Mrs. Davis and myself were unloading some things in the that we brought up before the van came out. <clears throat> Mr. Hudson, the late Mr. Hudson, and I believe the mayor, Ben Davis, I believe he was mayor at that time, came up to my house and he said, I'm going to interrupt you momentarily. He said, we want you to run for mayor. <laughs> so listen, I told this little lady over here, if she move out here, I'll build her a nice home. And when I went somewhere at night, I would take her. If I couldn't take her, we'd stay home. Well, they kept on, I won't use the word wart, but they kept on after me. My telephone was ringing and they wanted me to run for something. So I finally came down and signed up to run for city council. So <clears throat> that was, I don't know when the election was now, but anyway, I said, well, I won't be elected. No one knows. Me. But I ran. So I ran. All right, in the meantime, now if anybody here lives in Garland, I don't really mean this. <laughs> <laughs> the meantime, excuse me, I had that second piece of pie while I was doing that. In the meantime, I had a what I would call a dirty letter from the mayor of Garland. And he said, you cannot send your mail to Saxe. Saxe doesn't exist. It's not a town. You will not get your mail if you, if you say sexy. So I cooled off about 10 days and I answered that letter. And in that letter, I, I remember her specifically telling him that I didn't want to live in Garland. He wanted, us to, he wanted to say Garland, Texas. I said, I didn't want to live in Garland. That's why I moved to Saxe. I don't know anybody in Garland. I was lying a little bit. <laughs> I said, furthermore, I don't even like anybody that lives in Garland. <laughs> and I said, of course, I didn't really mean that because some of my best friends live in Garland. 
But I said, I don't intend to live in Garland. I'm going to live right where I am. I had my space card printed, my checks printed, said sexy. Okay, <clears throat> then the election time came. <clears throat> I don't remember what time. There was 48 votes cast. Guess who got 47 of them? <laughs> So I was, I was moved in as the, uh, as the councilman. So I stayed on that job about 11 months, I believe, and I believe this was Mr. Ben Davis, who was the mayor. I'm going to, he resigned, I, I forget. Joe, uh, Joe, do you remember if he resigned? He resigned shortly before his death. <clears throat> All right. Anyway, I was the only retired person on the council, so I got pushed in as the mayor. All right. I was pushed in as mayor. <clears throat> The next part I have a telephone call. She said, are you the new mayor? I said, that's what they told me last night. <laughs> well, she said, I'll fix the sue the city. <laughs> I said, for what? She said, I bought a new dress and I put it in the washing machine and the water came on, it was rusty, it ruined my dress. I said, I don't remember who it was, I don't, don't, don't know if I ever knew. I said, lady, how long have you lived in Saxon? She said, three or four years. I said, then you knew about the water being rusty one day and fire the rust to the next and fire to clean the next. She said, yes. I said, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The, uh, the next thing, I, when I accepted this mayor's job, the next thing I ran into, <coughs> I believe the population is about 550, but Stone and I were discussing that momentarily. I believe it was about 550 in uh, 1968. And uh, when I took over the mayor's job, I, uh, I found out that about 50% of the people that lived out here was anywhere from 30 to 90 days behind with this rusty water bill. <laughs> <laughs> so we sent out a notice that uh, you had 30 days to pay your bill or have your water cut off. So the next council meeting, <clears throat> there's a fellow, and by the way, that was in this room right here, I believe. Is that right, Joe? <laughs> Did we buy that building the first year I was in here, this building we're in now? Probably so. <clears throat> this man said, I'm going to whip you. <laughs> <laughs> and so I didn't, I never was a fighter in my life. <laughs> so there's a fellow, one of my neighbors had moved in and said back there, he said, that's why Mr. Davis said, you're going to the bed. He said, I'll take care of this fellow. So he got up to get him with this other guy went out the side door. <laughs> so he caused, a, he caused no trouble. Among other things in there, we found that they had about over $19,000 in the bank. It was all in a checking account. So we moved that into uh, uh, a savings account, except for uh, very few dollars. I don't remember now. But, oh, yes, my home that, that I live in now is all electric. And the light bill the TPL gave me was $36 a month. That lasted for about two or three years. You know what my light bill was last month? <laughs> $189. <laughs> Chief Stone was a far chief out here. Everybody loved him. Everybody liked him. And we hate to see Chief Stone get out of the uh, city of business. Our, our police protection out here was uh, run by the Dallas County Sheriff's Department. And if I remember about three days a week, a deputy sheriff would drive out here and drive around a little bit. And uh, there was not too much on the other side of the highway over there, uh, not too many buildings. Most of it was over on this side, if I remember correctly, and uh, and in, in my in Saxon Ranch Estate Edition, which incidentally was the first edition built out here, I believe I'm right, is this right? And I built the first house on my street. So uh, anyway, that was the protection we had out there. Today we have an excellent police department, we have a very fine fire department, and uh, I, I, I'm a, a proud of a number of things that took place out here. Uh, one is that uh, during this about 13 months that I sat in the mayor's office, by the way, we didn't have this nice up here, Mr. Mayor. It wasn't this nice up here. We just had a desk and a bunch of food and chairs. <clears throat> All right, we, we, uh, we discussed the possibility of sexy having a, a, a number one sewer system, 
the number one war department. We worked on it in, in uh, securing information. It, I think that the results of it is our war department today and our sewer system is good. And I could stop there, but I won't. <laughs> I, uh, uh, I feel like that uh, we are being imposed upon by the city of Garland. Garland's a nice town. We spend a lot of money in Garland. It's a nice place, and I repeat, I have a lot of friends there. But Garland has always wanted Saxon. Anybody want to agree with that? <laughs> They've always wanted Saxon. I think if we would uh, allow them to annex Saxon today, maybe some of our troubles will stop. But I've got for Garland having Saxon. I don't want Garland to have Saxon. I want to stay here. When I moved out here, I was going to stay here as long as the Lord let me live. And that's the way I still feel about it. So we worked on this, and I'm very proud that we uh, were able to uh, get something started, and today we have this system. And I won't get off on this sewer business because uh, I um, just don't think I should. I will say this, that uh, last fall, I believe it was, I wrote the mayor of Garland a letter. I never met this lady. By the way, she's not here, I don't guess. <laughs> <laughs> I told her that I said, I was at, I said, I've been in Saxe a number of years, and, and when I moved out here, the, uh, the traffic on Highway 78 was just normal. I said, the day sometime I have to wait five or six minutes to even get on the highway from, from uh, where I live. I said, I would appreciate you using your influence on helping get 78 at least divided, uh, developed into at least four lane highway. But I made a mistake and I said on the bottom of my postscript, I said, uh, regardless of the fact that girl is trying to use their sexy for a place to dump their, dump their garbage, I said, we still have to use this highway to come into girl where we spend our money. I guess I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> she didn't answer my letter. <laughs> didn't answer that, no. But anyway, I want to, uh, I want to uh, uh, tell you that I haven't been here as long as a lot of you have. I've been here a lot longer than some of you. But I'm all for our little town out here. I think it's a nice, clean, quiet town. And in spite of the high cost we paid for sewage, by the way, mine went up $2 a month. <laughs> Uh, it's still a nice town. I like it, and I had my home on, up for sale for a couple of years, and it didn't sell. And finally, uh, we went to California at the request of my friend and wife's daughter. I couldn't take it in California. We stayed out there four months, and I came back, took my house off the market, and it is not for sale. <laughs> So I appreciate being out there. Now, this is not, has nothing to do with, uh, with Saxe, but if I, someone gave it to me and I thought it would fit in right here. I think, is our police chief here? No. He's not here. Well, I think we have an excellent police department. I think they, I think they were very fine. Someone gave me this, and I thought in closing I would read this to you. This is pretty good. Said you were driving 55. And then when I came up behind you, you started doing 75, the highway trooper said to the elderly farmer. The farmer said, yes, I know, the farmer replied. My wife ran off of the highway patrolman, and when I saw you coming behind me, I thought you were bringing her back. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. We appreciate your comments. <laughs> Our next speaker will be, be Mr. Joe Stone. As I said before, my name is Stone, born and raised in Saxe. He was uh, instrumental in setting up the fire department. He was our fire chief for a number of years since retired. We appreciate him. He's on the board of directors of the Saxe Historical Society and has been instrumental in uh, putting this together. He serves as our treasurer. I'll bring him up now, Mr. Joe Stone. said I was born in Saxe 63 years ago on February. Although I did move away for a short period of time, but me and my wife came back 25 years ago. And they asked me today if I would speak on the old schoolhouse, as we call it now, that's up here on b with which all the heavy equipment sets around. 
I may be a, a year or two off in my thinking or my memory, but I was only seven or eight years old back when I'm going back to. It. But uh, I don't remember the three-story schoolhouse that was here at that time. Although I, I may have went to it, but I just don't remember. And my recollection goes back to about the time when this new schoolhouse was built, somewhere around 37 or 38. <coughs> right, <laughs> but I'm going by when I left here to go to Garland. But all the children, uh, which was only about 30 or 35 <coughs> in my memory, we went down to uh, Naiman School at the uh, Maimon School and Highway 78 or Levon Drive in that grove of trees that are still standing, there was a, a one-room schoolhouse there. And all the students here went to that school down there while this present building was being built. And I think that it was built by the uh, CC camp in those days. They didn't have nothing else for them to do, so they built a new school. And, uh, we were down there one year, I believe, and then came back to the new schoolhouse, which was all brand new. And it was, I believe, had three classrooms, one, two, and three, and four, and five, and six, and seven. We, all, we had three teachers, the best of my memory, and the principal, he taught the class two, which was uh, Mr. Johnson. and. Uh, that Miss Hudson spoke on the brown bag and the paper sack and, and uh, surf buckets. We did the same thing then. We had uh, in one one little room at the far end. We had a where well, we left our lunches and they had the screen wire a cage made out of screen wire that we left our lunches in, so the flies and such wouldn't get on and. Right beside of it was another little room. It was our uh, cafeteria, I guess you might call it, where we sit down and eat. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that uh, was allowed mostly for the seventh graders, seventh grade was as high as it went here. Then we went to Garland to go to high school. At that time, we only had 11 grades of school. And uh, most of the time, the seventh grade boys got to pump the water. We didn't have uh, running water. We had a, the well is still out in front of the, uh, the building at this time. But we had a, it looked like the capital, I'm not the capital, but Austin, the Alamo was shaped kind of like that. It had drinking troughs on each side with spigots and it had a, a pump in there. If, if we were good boys in the class, we got to go out and pump it up. <laughs> Fill up the tank so the rest of the kids could have something to drink. And one thing that does stick in my mind real well is the auditorium, which uh, it had a red or purple velvet uh, draw curtain come across like this. And then on the inside it had a, a roll down curtain with advertisements on it. All uh, the merchants bought ads on that. And, and uh, we were all, always having a play of some kind or something it seemed like. And uh, pie suppers, I remember the pie suppers. You call them bake sales now, I think. <laughs> but uh, they had pie suppers. And uh, they would sell the pies, the ladies would bring the pies and people would buy them and they'd eat them right there most of the time. And one of the, one of the things that the boys always got paddles for was, uh, as Miss Hudson said, outdoor plumbing. I don't guess anybody in Saxe had the septic systems at that time. But, well, I, 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 I said, <laughs> well, we called them toilets in them days. <laughs> And uh, one, of, one of the favorites that some of the boys like to do, and me included occasionally, as the girls would go to the restroom or to the toilet, we like to get out there and throw rocks out. <laughs> <laughs> well, they'd run out straight to Mr. Johnson, and we would get a pat. 
I thought she somebody that may remember some of those things. <laughs> but those were what they called the good old days. Of <laughs> we did ride the school bus then. Uh, the Garland school bus uh, came by, which most of us called it a box. It was just as square as it could be, all the way around. And one day, my dear brother, who's two years younger than I am, he decided that he was going to let the school bus run over his foot. <laughs> well, it, he did, but it stopped right on top of him. And you should have seen that bus driver come out of there. <laughs> Fortunately, it didn't break anything, it just smashed him. <laughs> And I, uh, my class graduated, which we got diplomas from the seventh grade. And in 1940, and then we went to Garland High School. And the new schoolhouse only lasted about two more years or so, three maybe at the most. The, uh, at that time, you could transfer to Garland for, I believe, t eight or ten dollars month or a year to to go to school and most of the students here had uh, transferred to Garland even to the elementary school. So the, the school was closed down pretty shortly thereafter. And I, it, I believe it stayed vacant for quite a while and then at some point back there when the city was trying to organize and incorporate and such, the county owns the building at that point and offered it to the city for $3,000. But they wasn't $3,000 in all the sacks that time. <laughs> anyway, they didn't buy it. And it, uh, then Johnson Manufacturing Company in Wiley now, uh, makes uh, children's clothes, I believe. They moved into the building, this is where they started, and uh, stayed there for a short period of time and then moved to Wiley. And then someone bought the building, I guess, and turned it into an apartment house. Divided the classrooms up, and I don't know just how long people did live in there, but there was there people living there for quite a while. And the present owner uh, <coughs> purchased it something like 18 or 20 years ago, and now uses it as a uh, uh, repair shop for his heavy equipment. And that's about the story that I've got on the old Saxe School Lab. It is still there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Does anyone have any questions of any of our three speakers? I'll open it up for questions now. Anyone have any questions they'd like to direct at uh, any of our three speakers about the past? Yes, sir. I'd like to know where the uh, one making the uh, Cellar or something that William's actually stayed in. I'd like to know where it's located. I'd like to see it. <laughs> Mary Lena, I'll let you feel that one. Then at the top of Woodrow Sacks, they feel that property now is up at the corner of the Whitman Ranch Road. I called him, but um, he said very poor health. It's the corner of the Whitman Ranch Road. Mm -hmm. That's where William Sachs first built his home at the corner of the Whitten Ranch Road. Is uh, he called the ranch the Lone Oak Ranch? Lone Elm. Lone Elm Ranch. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? If not, at this time, I'll take some time to uh, speak a little bit more about the Historical Society uh, and introduce our board members and our officers. As I mentioned, I'm Pat Boyd. I'm the president. Our secretary is Lloyd Henderson, the city manager. The city treasurer, Joe Stone. Another board member at the back, Randy Glover. Another member at the back, uh, Marilyn Dow. Miss Joyce Andre just went in the kitchen to work on our uh, refreshments. Mary Eileen Jones is a board member. Miss Alma Ingram is also a board member. Uh, let's see if I missed anyone. Kay Ashley is also a board member. She's not present with us today. But as I said, the uh, Historical Society was formed to preserve historical objects and data representative of Saxe as the city was established and has developed so that the community's heritage may be kept alive and available to the public. Any person or business interested in the objectives of this organization may become a member upon payment of dues. 
The annual due shall be $10 for individual family membership and $50 for corporate membership. The due shall be payable at the time of enrollment and January 1st of each successive year. The annual meeting of the organization will be held the third week of January as it is this year. The, ha the Saxe Historical Society is a registered corporation in the state of Texas. All donations will become the sole property of the corporation and will be available to the public as the state space will permit. We have presently at this time a display that was brought and uh, shown by Miss Mary Eileen Jones, who is a great granddaughter of William Saxe. At this time, I'll bring her up to the podium to kind of explain what the display is so we can uh, all take a few minutes and look at it a little bit later. Mary? <coughs> I fall somewhere between Cleo and uh, Joe on this school business. In between the three-story frame that Cleo talked about and the one that's there now that Joe talked about, there was a little red brick schoolhouse. And I went to that one. <laughs> <laughs> Just to keep the record straight on schools. Our display today, you will notice we have brought the archives copy of the original land grant deed to William Saxe. In the legal description mentioned on that deed, it is noted that his property was adjacent to the property of Daniel Herring. Now, Daniel Herring and William Saxe were the only two original landowners in this area that stayed here, and that was through a lot of persistence and even more hard work. Their families, each of them, is in sixth and seventh generation still living in this area. William Saxe was a young man, just in his middle twenties when he came to Saxe. Uh, Daniel Herring was older, a more mature man, um, a middle son of William Saxe's second marriage was J.K. Saxe, and he married the eldest granddaughter of Daniel Herring. That is the focus of our uh, exhibit today, living in Saxe a hundred years ago. Aside from the hat that is displayed, which belonged to William Saxe, and which was a parcel <coughs> of his father, which it was kept by J.K. Saxe, all the other items on display were in the 1890s home of J.K. and Molly Saxe. Their first home was located on DeWitt Road, just north of Ranch Road, which was mentioned a few minutes ago. J.K. and Molly were a, a wonderful couple. They were uh, keenly intelligent, forward-looking, and civic-minded. Their property extended from 544 to this area. In fact, uh, J.K. Saxe owned most of the property north of the railroad that's on the original Saxe City plot. The pictures that are displayed are of William Saxe and Martha Saxe. Those are originals, they're not copies. Every picture that's exhibited today is an original picture. The interior shot is of the house that we mentioned that is on, was on the wet road north of Ranch Road. The globe that is to the left by the hat is an original kerosene lamp globe and you will see in the picture it uh, was in the center of that room served as a chandelier. Several pieces of the furniture in that picture still exist in our family. The picture next to that is a very young picture of Nell Herring, who was Molly's younger sister. It also is an interior shot made at that same house in the 1890s. And then the final picture is of J.K. and Molly shortly after their wedding. They moved to Saxe, 5937 DeWitt, early this century, just after the turn of the 1900s, 5937 DeWitt, which is my mother's present address. It was because that they saved the nicer things that they had, and my mother in turn preserved them, we were able to exhibit them today. I would now like if all descendants of Saxe and Herring family that are present to stand up so we can see how many we have here. Other cousins promised to call other cousins, and it must be very proud. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Elaine. <coughs> I'm 
Mike mentioned one other time, we uh, are interested in membership. I have at the front here some applications for membership. If you already are a member, there's some renewal forms. We're in for our second year. If anyone is interested, they either contact themselves, pick up the form, or contact any of the other board members. We'd love to have you as a member. Uh, also up front is a copy of our bylaws, if anyone would like to look those over. At this time, I'll dismiss this program, and we'll break for some punch and some cookies and some displays and just in general visit. I appreciate your attention. We're dismissed. Thank you. Thanks for the hospital. J.K. Saxe as a memento of his father. It is size 678 and has a Singer Brothers label in it. The lamp globe is the one pictured in the center picture. It is part of a kerosene hanging lamp in the 1890s home of Molly and J.K. Saxe. The first picture displayed is William Saxe. The second one is his wife, Martha Frost Saxe. The center picture is an interior shot, which is rather rare in those days, of J.K. and Molly Saxe's home on the Wet Street just north of Ranch Road. Pictured are J.K. and Molly and Molly's younger sister, May. The next picture is Nell Herring, age three. She was a younger sister of Molly and May. The picture had uh, been made in the same house as the other interior shot. The final picture on the end is J.K. and Molly Saxe about the time of their wedding in the early 1890s. Starting from the other end, the telescope was used by J.K. Saxe for many years. On horseback or later when he um, had a truck and a car, he would stop and look at his field hands from afar. And then he would drive up to them and know immediately which ones had been leaning on the hole or playing off in some manner. And they were never able to figure out how Mr. Saxon knew that they weren't working. The view, uh, picture viewer was a fixture in their living room in the 1890s. The spoon holder and sugar bowl and the toothpick holder were dining room objects, and the red beads toward this end were worn by Molly Saxe. We still have the original box and the blue cotton that they were um, uh, stored in when she bought them. We'll go ahead and get started with our uh, our invocation given by Pastor Max Kennedy, Clark Lake Baptist Church, right here in beautiful Saxe, Texas. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the time that you've given us, Lord, and we thank you so much for these people who have gathered today. Lord, we ask you to help us uh, continue to be grateful for our history, where we are so thankful for the heritage that we have as a city, uh, Lord, as a people together here. We're thankful for the work, the hard work that's been put in for those who uh, really care about our history. And Lord, we pray that you give that burden to more and more people. 
Lord, we know there would be no history without you because it is your story. And we just acknowledge your presence, we acknowledge your love. And we just ask that uh, Jesus Christ be lifted up in this city where there would be many, many people come to know you personally as a result of the testimony of those who went before us. Lord, help us to remember, help us to never forget the wonderful love that you showed us in your son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Lord, we love you and we thank you today. We ask your blessings upon the ones about to take place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Es posible que como fatalmente en esto. in 2 Timothy 2.15, which says, To study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. These children participate in uh, uh, scripture memorization and, and, and learning the word of God and applying it to their, to their lives. At this time, we'd like to have some uh, special selected readings by our very own Mr. N.W. Ogle. Mr. Ogle. <laughs> After hearing music here, I'm almost afraid to read any of my poetry, but I will anyway. <laughs> this one's entitled Nostalgia. The dusty road winds onward past the old familiar scene. The pink and white of cotton bloom, adjacent cornfields green. Pinkle of cowbells serenade is up to the meadow lane. Trudge weary farmers homeward bound. It's milking time again. White picket fence stands guard about the fading farmhouse lot. Front yard ablaze with myriad hue. The petunia rose forget me not. Lilac bordered entry gate, unfettered by chain or lock, gives passage to a weathered walk in this buttercup and full clock. The well house shades a welcome spring. Salt cedars here abound. Sweetest waters flow beneath that anywhere are found. The fragrance of home baked bread wafts out across the way. Voices sound within the door. 
there's rest at the end of day. Deprive me not my pleasant thoughts, though all these things are missing. They're just as vivid in my mind as I sit reminiscing. I have a little bit that uh, my wife and I have been involved with poetry of uh, the Mockingbird chapter in McKinney for over 20 years in the state and the national. And we meet at the old at the carriage house back of the Herd Craig mansion just off the downtown Old Courthouse Square. And Art Club meets there at a different time. And once a year, they select one of their paintings and make photographs of it and share it with our portrait club and anybody with enough nerve to think that they can write something that the picture depicts or if you already have one. So I have one that, that carries me back even though the, the lady gave me the photograph and said this is an old red barn. And I looked at it and I said that's not a red barn, that's a railroad station. And so that carried me back to it. J.C. Lepper and I were neighbors and grew up together and walked the railroad to school. That was the special if it had been raining. Those roads were purely mud. And anyway, he'll probably remember more of it than I did. I imagine he could have done a better job. But I tie the catch and the peak and the Santa Fe. The sight of a venerable railroad station brings back a flood of memories to me in this contrasting, fast-paced, small world walking the railroad to a three-teacher country school to avoid the, mu the muddy, sometimes almost impassable road, challenging the snakes and tortoises for our share of the wild dewberries on either side of the track in the spring, moving well aside for the hissing, clanking, steam locomotives to pass, remembering the countless hobos who rode the freight trains or frequently walked the tracks, sold meager possessions, tied in a bag swinging from a stick over the shoulder. They often stopped to bag a handout from impoverished farmers who usually had the compassion to accommodate. The lonely sounds of the train whistle reverberating on crisp winter night air are stamped indelibly in my mind. I wouldn't wish for a return to those days of depression, but I would welcome a slow-paced time with morals and values again openly expressed. I'll read you one more and I'll let you get on to better things. This is titled In Retrospect. Gone the scenes that I once knew, where secret succulent berries grew. Shaded lane, long since forgotten, missing too the fields of cotton. Where farmhouse so proudly stood, now crumbling brick, decaying wood. Fragrance of lilac bush no more or trellis vine beside the door, leaning windmill and dress for poses, face and twine with running roses, wheels still faithfully groans and creeps, the labored tank endowed with leaves. Fence is fallen, posts askew, barbed where I tangle sadly too, abandoned fields barren now, unencumbered by hoe or plow. Stately oaks now gnarled and broken, false return of words once spoken my friends departed through passing years memory is steeped in misty tears i don't know how or why i should but granted power so that i could my calendar quickly disappear the clock turned back to bygone year thank you very much mr ogle uh, he does have a book out too. I don't know if he brought it in today, but uh, I'm sure we can we can twist his arm to sell a few copies. <laughs> well, I want to welcome everyone here today. Um, we're kind of a smaller crowd than normal, and there's probably two reasons for that. Number one, we did we did not publicize this year's annual meeting like we did last year, and number two, uh, we decided to dispense with our essay contest that we normally have, and uh, the, the board made that decision. I dare say that the board will not make that same mistake on a decision next year, and uh, we'll probably have our essay contest back again. But uh, now comes the business meeting portion of our, of our, well, let me, first of all, I want to be sure and I'll welcome any special guests, give any special recognition. I, I do see one of our uh, astute members of our Planning and Zoning Commission in the crowd, who is also a member of the Historical Society, Mr. Charles Spray. Thank you for coming out. 
and his wife, his wife and Marie. And uh, I see a previous member of our Planning and Zoning Commission, Mr. Paul Conant. Thank you for coming out too, sir. And um, we do have the, the media here. The press is here. The Wiley News is represented. Uh, Ms. Pat Patty Montagno. So. Yeah. Be nice to her. She may take your picture. Okay, now we'll move on to the, uh, to the business portion of our meeting. Uh, if, you are, if you are currently a member, not a board member, not just a board member, but currently a member of the Historic Society, uh, you, will, you will be allowed to, uh, to vote on these issues. But we'll get through this business portion next, and then we'll go on to the, to the uh, as Mr. Ogle put, the more fun stuff. So, first of all, we'll have the uh, Treasurer's Report. If I could ask our, our Treasurer, Mr. Joe Stone, to come give us a, a report. benefit of those who did not receive uh, a copy of this uh, as of January the 1st of 2000 we had $2,341.77 in our banking account we had income during the year of $210 from membership dues $1,075 from donation and sales of miscellaneous items of $890. We had expenses $442.06. As of December the 31st of, of year 2000, beginning this year, we had $4,074.88 in our banking account. The donations this year was $1,075. The biggest donation that, that contributed to that was Fall Fest Committee gave us $975 to uh, purchase a uh, carport type for our fire truck that we're going to restore last year, or in the future. I said last year, but no, we're going to do it in the future. Yeah, we were going to do it last year, but we never got around to it. But do we have any questions on anything that? Uh, the treasury report that I might answer that I didn't specify here. Okay, you've heard the uh, treasurer's report as printed by our treasurer, Mr. Joe Stone. Do I hear a motion to approve the treasurer's report as presented? So moved. So moved by Mr. Bob Jones. Is there a second? Second by Ms. Mary Eileen Jones. All in favor of approving the uh, treasurer's report as presented by Mr. Joe Stone, please signify by saying aye. Can you oppose? <coughs> treasurer's report is <coughs> passed unanimously. Okay, our next item of business is to uh, is to elect uh, new new board members and officers for the Saxony Historical Society. Uh, if you if you picked up off the back table or received in the mail uh, a report from the nomination committee. It says uh, members and uh, alternate members. This is actually talking about board members now. Uh, our bylaws allow us to have up to 11 board members, and then we amended the bylaws, if you recall, last year. We can also have up to uh, three alternate members. So the report uh, from the nomination committee for members for board membership, uh, they, they've nominated uh, myself, Paul Head, Bob Jones, Louise Conant, Joe Stone, Everett Hart Herman, Mr. Jeff Halp, Ms. Hazel Gregory, Mr. Noble Ogle, uh, Mr. Randall Cooper, and uh, Helen and J.C. Ledbetter. For uh, alternates, the nomination committee has recommended Ms. Mary, Mary Eileen Jones, Rita Head, and Carol Jones. And uh, should I wait till this train to get by? Welcome to Saxony. <laughs> Nomination committee recommended, uh, dis despite my objection.
despite my uh, kicking and screaming and, and uh, over my objections, the uh, nominations committee this year recommended uh, to re-elect me as president. Uh, I was kick I was protesting against that one, not the rest of them. Uh, Bob Jones for vice president, Louise Conan for secretary, uh, Mr. Joe Stone as treasurer, and uh, yeah, that would be the officers. So does everybody understand who the who the board members are recommended now for nomination and who the officers are recommended for nomination. And uh, is there anybody that would like to, uh, from the floor, amend, amend this recommendation or uh, any suggestions to subtract or add or delete? Or, or do I hear a motion to accept the uh, nomination committee's report? Motion by Ms. Sue Dillard to accept the uh, report from the nominations committee. Is there a second? Second by Ms. Carol Jones. All in favor of accepting uh, the nominations committee report to, uh, for the, the new board members and officers, please signify by saying aye. Any opposed? Okay. Well, just to wake everybody up, would the, uh, would, would the uh, board, new board members please stand up? It would be Paul Head, Bob Jones, Louise Conant, Joe Stone, Everhard Herman, Jeff Haupt, Hazel Gregory, Noble Ogle, Randall Cooper, and Mr. and Mrs. Ledbetter. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. These are, these are our, our new board members. Next item of business is a word about uh, what we did in 2000. I guess probably one of the uh, biggest hits, uh, one of the neatest things we did in 2000 was put together our Saxe Historical Society Y2K calendars. Um, these, these were calendars that showed some of the pictures of the old uh, uh, homes that were in, in Saxe, some of the old architecture. Unfortunately, I don't guess any of them are, st are still standing, but uh, we were able to sell some of these at Fall Fest and, uh, and give some away. And, and, uh, really, uh, the, the drawings I think originally came from Mary Eileen Jones's book, Saxe Remembered, very interesting. Very the pictures are actually suitable for framing, so we we got a lot of those out distributed. Uh, we had a, a, the uh, book by, about the Hearing family that was donated to the library. Uh, we also participated in Fall Fest again this year. I believe we donated was it one or two T-shirts, Patty? Anyway, we donated some shirts to Fall Fest. Two of them, okay. <laughs> and uh, the Fall Fest committee actually uh, awarded us. As Joe mentioned, $975 for the purchase of an 18 by 24 metal carport, which we hope to uh, uh, use to, to uh, put the 1948 Aaron's Fox fire engine under when we get to restoring it, as well as uh, where we'll display it at the museum site along with uh, other uh, old farm implements and artifacts. So we're very grateful for that, for that donation. We, uh, we got a lot of exposure this past year from the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, one of our newest board members, Mr. Haupt, his wife, uh, works in that caboose, and so she's given us a lot of exposure and uh, uh, tried to sell a lot of our t-shirts and, and, and I think uh, maybe one of our coverlets. We also donated one of our coverlets, which you see on the back table there, to the uh, uh, Chamber Banquet. We also had input uh, this past year into the Comprehensive Master Plan. Uh, Saxe is looking at trying to, uh, Saxe has hired a consultant and is looking to the citizens to determine how the rest of the build out of our town will look. Historical Society has a, has a key part in the input of this conference and master plan. And we're fortunate to have Mr. Jeff Howell, who has represented us on the steering committee. He'll be giving us a brief report on that later on. We also had input uh, into where Highway 190 is going to go, the extension of the George Bush uh, Turnpike. Uh, part of it will go through Saxe, and so everybody's excited, I guess, about that in many different ways. And, uh, a few different members have given input there. Sue Dillard has represented us, as well as myself and others. The uh, Pleasant Valley Cemetery Association, I believe they're getting a historical marker, and there may be a, a, a ceremony at some time we'll get to, to uh, see that presented. Then there's the museum. We still have uh, an agreement with the city for the old uh, brick annex building over by the cemetery, which uh, one day will be a museum. I think, in my lifetime. Um, we, the year before last, we went ahead and put down a, uh, a rock pad for display of, of our old farm implements. Um, 
we, we've looked at different architects renderings and maybe turning it into the looking like an old prairie style home we've done several things but uh, in the meantime we've, we've also been uh, informed by that, that we need to be in compliance with city codes and zoning standards so uh, I can't believe how time flies, believe it, or not, believe it or not, this time last year we were actually beginning the process of getting an SUP, it's a special use permit through the city, to, uh, to have our museum. We, uh, we got the city to designate a specific museum classification in their zoning, and, uh, and now we're in the process of trying to get the, the SUP for outside display. Uh, one of the issues, I guess the primary issue, is probably liability and insurance issues. And uh, even though it seems uh, quite frustrating that we're still, that we're still getting further and further away from getting to this museum, there are some good reasons that, that we're not there yet and we need to be sure and, and address some of these insurance liability issues and, and uh, as well as look at uh, a museum policy. Uh, Mr. Everhart Herman has, has uh, given us a lot of insight from some of the meetings he's attended as to what we need to do uh, to put together a museum policy. Um, the city council was very gracious to reduce the, the fee. There's normally a $400 fee to make application for an SUP. They reduce it down to $50, so we're grateful for that. And uh, going into 2001, that is one of our main, main objectives, is to try to make this museum a reality. We've already got uh, Amtrak cars going through our town, so it would have been nice to have, uh, you know, you have the caboose out there. If Charles would get his funeral home finished, if we get the museum finished, it would have been nice to have something that they could and see and say, hey, that's sexy when they go through their town. But we'll get there. The, uh, the 1948 Aaron's Fox fire engine that uh, Joe took to many a fire up until uh, the mid to late 80s is uh, still rotting away in a field. Uh, I, did, I didn't finish cleaning up my toys today, so my wife let me go ahead and bring my Aaron's Fox with me if you want to see what, uh, what it looks like. Um, we would like to, to make that, uh, restore that drywall condition, have it a little more presentable for outside display at our museum site. And hopefully we'll get there also. We're really, again, grateful to the chamber for, for this uh, donation to, to enable us to not only, uh, not only put up a, uh, a structure where we can do the restoration of the fire truck and be in compliance with code and city ordinances, but we'll also have a structure where we can display it once, it's, once it is restored. We also want to try to identify, identify uh, any and all remaining old structures, which there's just not that many left in this town, and at least identify and maybe somehow mark some of the sites where some of these older structures once were. Uh, we hope to maybe compile a list. Uh, we will need our curator for museum compile a list of what of what uh, our town is looking for us to display in the museum. Uh, maybe begin soliciting uh, pictures. We have uh, a few videotapes. Uh, in years past, the Historical Society has interviewed uh, key folks that were part of the heritage of our town. And we have some video of that. We're videotaping this meeting today, I think. <laughs> we have last year's uh, videotape, which we will play during our effort we adjourn. Hopefully, we'll get uh, some of these tapes edited together and maybe put together just a nice little package of, uh, of the history of our town. Uh, we're, we're also uh, contributing to the city's website. Whether or not Saxe does have a website, cityofsaxe.org, I believe, something like that. And uh, we're going to be putting, uh, contributing more to that piece of the website. Uh, Councilman Scott Stauffer keeps reminding me that he's very interested in the, uh, in the railroad history of our town. As, as you remember from last year, he had a really beautiful display of uh, railroad pocket watches. And uh, maybe we can coax him at some point to uh, organize some kind of a study of the importance of the railroad through our town. And um, if you picked up one of the, uh, the big sheets of paper back there that kind of gives a history of Saxe, you see a little picture of uh, William Saxe's lumber wagon, not a shop wagon, right? Lumber wagon. And uh, we hope maybe at some point to, to get a hold of that also for display. So a lot of things we want to do, it just takes, uh, takes members, it takes time, the volunteers of everybody who wants to participate. So, so those are kind of things on the on the burner. Okay, and now uh, just a quick word about a few of the items we have on display. Believe it or not, the only thing we'll try to sell you today is uh, if you're not a member, we'd like to sell you a membership. Uh, memberships are ten dollars for for a family membership. That you can, you can uh, get with Joe Stone, our treasurer, or, or you can. Uh, Sign up back there at the back table. We also have a few of the uh, real beautiful 
coverlets, Saxon coverlets available. Uh, they're $39.95 each. And also on display, we have uh, some old photo albums. Uh, we have um, uh, past president, Mr. Lloyd Henderson, put together a uh, compiled scrapbook of the, of the history of Highway 78. And we brought that for display today. We have uh, uh, a compilation of the caboose and how we ended up getting the caboose for the Chamber of Commerce. That's over here to look at. Uh, some, what do they call it, farrier equipment. I just call it horseshoe and tools. Anybody else bring anything? It's a show and tell time. Look, look, uh, looks, like, looks like I see a map back there. So, and, and Ms. Mary Eileen Jones brought a few things too, which I'm sure she'll, she'll be happy to tell you about. We'll have the video, the video from the last uh, year running during, during the time we adjourn. Uh, I'll have my 1948 Aaron's Fox sitting up here along with some more information about the Aaron's Fox fire engine. And that brings us to presentation time of the books. Are you ready, Karen? Why don't you come on to Karen? The, uh, again, this year, uh, well, back up a little bit. We have, a, uh, we have money that's been donated to the Historic Society kind of as an endowment, and uh, we every year use that, well, in theory we use the interest on that endowment to purchase books for the library. Um, seems like every year that I've been involved in the historic society, we've gone way over and above the amount of interest that, that endowment uh, provides to purchase books for the library. And this year, again, I'm just uh, really thrilled and pleased with this board's decision to uh, buy a bunch of books. We have a, a we're going to have a new library being built. I think we're going to be tripling the size of our existing library space wise. Oh, oh doubling, okay. Uh, get carried away, sorry. Tripling the size of the police station, I guess. Like doubling the size of the library. And uh, there's, there are quite a few books uh, about some of the different ethnic heritages in our, in our, in our state. The Germans and I guess the Swedes. And, uh, well, Drita, why don't you and Karen come tell us a little bit about these books? Can you grab a few of them? Yeah. Yeah. has worked with me the past few years to select items. She's been a delight to work with, and we together decided that we would concentrate on particular aspects of Texas history or toward a particular audience. For example, last year we concentrated on books for youth. This year we decided to concentrate on all the different, different ethnic backgrounds that make us Texans. And I think we've got a total of about 18 or 19 items, all concerning the fact that Texas is an ethnic melting pot. There are a number of selections covering German Americans, African American Texans, Greek Texans, Japanese Texans, Swedish Texans, Polish Texans, you name it, they're over there. Thanks to you. We've never had, this is, these books have existed for a long time, but our library has never had the funding to purchase any of them. So in one fell swoop, you filled a tremendous void and we truly appreciate it. saying that's, uh, I guess, one of our excuses for not having the essay contest. We wanted to you know, we wanted really present, present a lot more books to the library this year, so, so trying to make up some excuses. We'll probably have the essay contest next year. Okay, um, at this time, Mr. Jeffrey, would you like to just give us a few words about what uh, 
what is happening with the city's comprehensive master plan and uh, your involvement and what that means to Saxe and to the historical society and to all of us in this room. I appreciate it. And if this is too buzzy, you don't have to use it or you can use it. Yeah. Well, I've got a question. Well, I appreciate everyone joining us here today. Um, the, the committee um, that I've been appointed to uh, representing the uh, Saxe Historical Society uh, basically, there's a steering committee uh, that uh, develops a comprehensive plan for Saxon. Uh, basically, looking at in the future for the next 10 to 20 years how we would like to see our community. Um, basically, uh, on zoning and planning, things uh, that'll help the Saxe, uh, the city of Saxe grow in the way that uh, the, the citizens of Saxe would like to see it. And of course, we've uh, inputted quite a bit of uh, input from the citizens of Saxe, which started in uh, April of last year. Uh, this has been somewhat of a long process. Uh, we're not quite where we would like to be, but uh, we're hoping to get there soon. Um, right now, we've uh, here in the past uh, month or so, we've had some uh, uh, neighborhood meetings and so forth to give the give the citizens of Saxe an idea of where we're at in the land use map and things of that sort. And of course that raised quite a few eyebrows and some of the maps and so forth. And a lot of that was due to uh, miscommunication as far as what was actually shaded, what color and so forth. So it really wasn't anything to be real alarmed about. Uh, and hopefully we explained that well to, to the citizens of Saxe. But um, we're currently in the process of developing and completing the land use Basically what that is, is to, to signify what areas of Saxe and what the use of that land will be used out in the future. Now, if some of those things are changing from its existing use today to what we would like to see it in the future, it doesn't mean we're going to wipe out what's existing. We're going to make sure that we continue to grow the way the citizens want to do that. Um, we, the main things, the goals that we wanted to make sure that we Saxe, a small bedroom type community, as well as having sure that we retain our, our country atmosphere. And we're hoping with the committee, committee that we have put together, we're able to sustain that. Um, and um, like I said, right now we're still in the process of finalizing the uh, land use map, which I have brought some copies if y'all would like to take a look at that. And I will explain some of the mistakes on the color coding and so forth. Um, in the next couple of months, um, we're going to be working the historical value of Saxon. We haven't quite gotten to that aspect of it yet, but we're hoping this, this coming month as well as next month we'll get more into the historical portion of this committee. And um, as a representative of the, of the Historical Society, I want to definitely solicit some input from, from the group make sure that we fulfill or to protect the historical value of Saxe. Um, in, in closing, uh, we, like I said, we're still in the process of doing uh, doing land use map, getting all that taken care of, which of course this is the older land use map that was done in the uh, early 90s. 1986. So there's a lot of changes compared to what's on the wall. And like I said, if you'd like to take a look at it, I'd be glad to show you that uh, map. And as well as the 190 thoroughfare. Um, from our last meeting, they still haven't decided if there's going to be a southern route or a northern route to the 190. Uh, we're hoping that will take the southern route because that will bring help us uh, develop a bigger tax base for Saxon. Um, the northern. Right. Southern Saxe, Southern Saxe, Northern Route. Yeah, that's correct. Southern Saxe, Northern Route. But uh, as you say, they, they go through several different conditions of these maps. So we're trying to, to make sure that we continue uh, the uh, help moisture our tax base so that uh, the homeowners are totally taking the, the burden of the tax base. Um, and uh, 
And as I said, if you could please provide any input on how you would like to see the historical sites uh, maintained and things of that sort of well, means please contact me. Um, or contact some of the members within the historical society so that we can get together and, and make sure that, that those views and concerns are expressed during these committee meetings. Um, and like I've uh, put and, and it's just become more apparent the older I get. Um, is that I'm finding out that without the history, there is no future. So hopefully we can maintain that history. Uh, the next meeting is April 5th. It's the first Thursday of every month. Yeah, and it's here in this area, in this building. And anyone's invited to come in and uh, visit with us and see what we're doing. Uh, there has been some heated conversations back and forth. It does get interesting occasion. So if you'd like to come join us and, and express your opinions, um, if you haven't been able to meet, come into some of the neighborhood meetings, um, by all means, uh, come and listen to see what happens and see what, we, what we've got planned. And don't be afraid to voice your concerns, because that's the only way that we can represent you as a citizen of Saxon in this committee. Excuse me. Uh, next week, uh, the 5th of April, is when the next committee meeting is. That would be for, that's for the 190. Yeah, that's uh, with the PNC, I believe. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, which one of those routes though goes through Sue Diller's backyard? One ninety. Dwellers, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, well, now we come to our keynote speaker. Uh, I know Mary Eileen Jones has uh, spent some time at the hospital last night, so she, <laughs> she so I appreciate her still being able to come out and, and uh, talk with us. But uh, Ms. Ms. Jones is a uh, is a great granddaughter great-granddaughter of William Saxon, pictured up here, and also a great-granddaughter of Daniel Perry, two of our, our founding families. And, uh, she she uh, wrote the book, uh, Saxon Remembered, the blue book you see in the library, and uh, asked her to just come tonight, today and kind of share with us what's on her heart, the uh, historical perspective of Saxon, and, and uh, just want to turn the, turn the floor over to Ms. Mary, Mary Allen Jones. Would you like to hold this microphone, or would you like to Okay. It's kind of getting fuzzy. First, I'll say it wasn't I who was in the hospital. It was my 97-year-old mother. I got home about 4 o'clock this morning. She's home. She's fine. She's in probably better shape than the rest of us <laughs> at this point, which we're very glad about. When Paul originally called and asked me, to speak today, I thought, I said, sure. And then I wondered, what will I talk about? And I decided perhaps to take the first 50 years, the first half century um, of Saxe. What was here in 1840, 1845? There were buffalo and deer. There were black bear. And there were educational and parent Indian tribe. Now, up until a few years ago, when you were on the old Saxe Highway, the Ben Davis Road, as it's now known, you crossed Rowlett Creek, you came to what is now Bunker Hill Road, and you made a turn. In that curve could be seen numerous buffalo wallows. So that was a popular place at that time, Rowlett Creek, in that particular corner. I drove by there recently. It's completely grown up in brush, brush, but I'll bet the buffalo wallows are still there if it's ever cleared up. That's the southern part of Saxe. In the northern part of Saxe on Maxwell Creek, which runs south of 544, it is well documented that there were numerous black bear. This was a beautiful, clear, 
rock bottom of Spring Fred Street in those in my days. A good four or five generations of us would uh, go and play in that water, wade in the water. But in their wisdom, the North Texas Water District decided to put a landfill in that exact spot. But that's where the black bears are known to have been. The Tenrod Indian groups were, for the most part, the friendly Caddo's from East Texas. <coughs> but most of you are familiar with the, the massacres that occurred in the Plano and McKinney uh, areas in the mid-1840s. These were said to have been the uh, nomadic Comanche tribes that resided in the Panhandle of Texas. So there you have the picture, the black bear, the buffalo, the black Tenerife Indian. And at this time, the state of Texas was undergoing the fourth contract with what is known as Peter's Colony, or otherwise known as Texas Immigration and Land Company. When the settlers came to Saxe, they came on the fourth contract of Peter's Colony. And by this time, the organizers had uh, run into all sorts of legal problems. We know the exact date that William Saxe and the exact date that Daniel Herring came to Saxe. Um, William came January 15, 1845. Daniel came December 25th, Christmas Day, 1848. But you will find their original Texas land grants are dated in May. 1854. That was because of the legal difficulties with the state. And it's interesting to note that the city of Dallas land grant also is dated in the spring of 1854. Many came when it is said that William Saxe only had a few neighbors. It's really not true. Every 640 acres was taken by some settler. But the only two that remained in this area were William Saxe and Daniel Herring. Many of the others left and went to California. We have documented letters in the Saxe Act archives. Um, people wrote back, you have never known hardship until you've gone to California by land. That would have been taking, attempting to take their herds to the desert lands. So William and David were here. Their first houses were very crude. William Saxes, of course, is known to have been a dugout which he lined with logs. There were three rooms. Daniel Herring's first house was a log cabin. Now, the reason Peter's Colony's fourth contract was so popular, this was part of the Texas Black Lands, fertile land that grew good crops. But there were also streams with trees, which were very necessary, not only for firewood, but for their first construction. So William and Daniel and their families had their first houses, which were crude, but their two land grants joined each other. The northeast corner of uh, Daniel's property joined the southwest corner of William's. In fact, they could signal to each other from their homes, and that must have been a comforting dog. Soon, however, they each built newer, more substantial houses. William went to the west of McKinney and hauled back rock. Being a German, of course, he was interested in a substantial rock home. It was L-shaped with the kitchen and the <coughs> cooking fireplace on the north. The bedrooms were on the south. The rock walls were 18 inches thick, which made each room have window seats because of the width of the rock wall. He built his house directly over his three cellar rooms, and in the center section were steps that went down to the cellar rooms, which were used for storage. He would buy soda with a keg, lamp chimneys by the gross and was reputed to have been very generous with friends and neighbors who happened to need any of the items that he stopped. Daniel's two-story house 
was about a lumber that he had to haul from East Texas. The nearest sawmill was Jefferson. It took three teams to pull one wagon through such areas as Muddy Creek Bottom right down here. My grandfather, who was Daniel's son, said it would often take an entire day to pull the three wagons with three teams each through and they would eat their supper at the same campsite that they ate their breakfast. The main feature of Daniel's house was a fireplace six feet long, five and a half feet tall, had an iron rod across it for the cooking pots. Of course there were skillets and kettles, but one of their main cooking pots was a large iron covered receptacle which was called an oven. We still have one of those iron um, details. So much for the first two houses and only two permanent houses in the 1840s, 1850s. The first commercial project in Saxe was the mill and gin that Mr. Saxe built directly across from his ranch house. This was the intersection in the northeast corner intersection of Ranch Road and DeWitt or Maxwell Creek Road as it changes names in that area. It was um, operated by oxen and horses. So we ended the 1840s and 1850s and we came into the 1870s and 1880s. Times had changed by then. Steam engine replaced a steam engine engine driven gin, replaced the oxen powered gin and mill. The original one burned, and he immediately ordered and set up a steam uh, operated one. And of course, the Civil War happened in the 60s. <coughs> It's interesting to note that there was a voting box called the Maxwell voting box, which is the one that both uh, William and Daniel would have voted at. And the vote was 54 to 7 for secession. Most of the men, uh, 17 to 50, enlisted, and William Saxe did enlist. Daniel Herring was an, an older man. He was a mature man, but he had come to Texas. In fact, he. Uh, he was a seventh generation American already by way of Virginia 1620s, Carolinas, and through uh, Illinois, and he had brought his, his mother with him to Texas. So he was over age for the Civil War. It's also interesting to note that it's documented that William Saxe had five slaves during the Civil War. Daniel Perry had none. But it, it's also a point of interest that as he came by way of Illinois to Texas, <coughs> he stopped at St. Louis at the slave market and for $1,000 in gold coins bought the largest, strongest black man available to act as a bodyguard as his family came to Texas. So that, that does add a little interest, I think, to the, uh, to the Civil War story. Also during the 60s, Texas is famous for its cattle drives. And both William and Daniel found time to be their own trail boss, take their own herds, their own horses to Kansas City. After the Civil War, there were deserters from the Union Army and also ex-Union soldiers that were here as we're in, I guess, most of the southern states to a greater extent. <coughs> One Herring family story is Daniel's son, Josh, and his sister, Martha, were on their way to town with, with mail cotton that they've been able to save. Times were hard here following the Civil War for their family's clothes, and they were stopped by a Union soldier who attempted to take the mail cotton away from them. But they were young teenagers, and Martha very fiery young lady, and she was so adam adamant about it that she talked the soldier out of not taking them the cotton, and they got to town and the family 
they did have clothes out of the pale cotton in the 1960s, 1860s. There had been private schools. We'll go on to the 80s and the 90s now. There had been private schools here all along because both Daniel Herring and William Saxe were highly educated men. The school that the Saxe children for the most part attended would have been the Decatur School, which was just north of the ranch house, the William Saxe ranch house, south of 544. One of the schools that the Herring children is known to have attended was just east of Raleigh Creek, a one-room school. And of course, they paid tuition for the children to go to these schools. And the teachers were paid, uh, for the most part, with land, because money was scarce again after the Civil War. The first public school in Saxe was at the corner of what is now Saxe Road and Billingsley Street, which is this direction. It was a one-room school. Uh, there was a blackboard at both ends. Half of the desk faced one direction, another half faced the other direction. The teacher divided the children according to age, with the younger ones facing one way and the older ones the other. And another interesting thing about that first school is it became a church on Sunday. And to me, the most amazing thing is the Christians met there in the morning Methodists in the afternoon, and both those churches still exist. The Christian church is the one that is now located down on Ben Davis Road near Highway 78. The Methodist church is the Pleasant Valley Methodist Church. The railroad, of course, was a big story in the 1880s. It went through a great many acres of both Daniel Harry and William Saxe's holdings. But Daniel had died in 1882. William was still alive, and he, being, I think, forever the entrepreneur, immediately gave 100 foot frontage to the Gulf of Colorado and Santa Fe Railroad for frontage through his property. And they, in turn, named the town Saxe and gave him a lifetime pass on all their lines. They built a very fine depot. It was still there when I was a child. I remember it very well. And immediately put up the name Saxe on the end. S-A-X-I-E. <laughs> and it remained that way. The, the postmark from the post office said Saxe was still in some of those for several years. And then all of a sudden the sign went down and it became Saxe not spelled phonetically, but spelled in the sexy way, right? <laughs> One of the saddest things that happened during the 80s was to uh, William Saxe. In those days, the tax assessors were not bonded by the state. They were bonded by the citizens. And William Saxe agreed to bond the tax collector Collin County, the tax collector, responded with all the money. It was a great deal of money, and the county required the cash immediately. And in order to raise that much cash, because apparently William Saxe kept his money well invested, at times he owned property from Rockwall to the east to the Peters Colony area on the, on the west. In order to raise a great deal of cash, very quickly, he sold property in the downtown Dallas area, and he sold herds of very fine horses. But not to be, I suppose, gotten down. The railroad came through. That was exciting. You just heard that whistle. Can you imagine what that must have been like when it was a big black steam locomotive, <coughs> and when this was open prairie land for the most part? So William said he was just going to move down by the railroad and sit on the porch and watch the trains go by. So that he did. Most of his large family was grown and gone. He had one teenage son still at home at that point. And Saxe was way ahead of Dallas at that point. We had mass transit here in 
1880. You can catch the train at 8 o'clock in the morning, ride to Dallas, go to the courthouse, take care of your business, or go over to Sanger Brothers and do a little shopping and catch the train back at 4 o'clock that very afternoon. Mm -hmm. Or if you had a, a social event in Dallas, you could catch the train at 6 p.m. in the evening, go to Dallas, spend the night, and return home at 10 o'clock the next morning. William Saxe died in 1899 and was the first person to be buried in the namesake Saxe Cemetery, for which he had been given the land at the time that the survey was made for the city. Daniel, who I mentioned died in 1882, was buried in the family cemetery on East Texas land grant, and you can still see it as you go north on Murphy Road from Saxe. It is a so I hope you will uh, remember the picture of Saxe 50 years before all this happened. Remember the Buffalo Wallace to the south, the Black Bear to the north, the occasional Indian that came through. And I will end with one of our family in Indian stories. William Saxe kept missing corn from his corn crib. So he finally hid out there one evening. And he caught the Indian who was stealing his corn. And he indicated to him that he would do him no harm but, he, but to come with him to his house, which then he did. And he gave him a very substantial supper, gave him back his corn. The Indian went on his way, and there was never any more corn stolen from him. Saxe Barnes. Mm -hmm. I have uh, brought this a few things. William's first barn was put together with these wooden bays. This stood until the 1940s when it was destroyed by fire. It was just north of Coit, uh, I'm sorry, Ranch Road on Maxwell Creek Road. It was destroyed by a tornado and my dad was uh, uh, thoughtful enough to go up and pick up some of these
Reno McKinney area. I guess I was thinking about the developers that came in, but that was some years ago. <laughs> <laughs> The, the items that uh, Ms. Jones brought on this table here, it, it, I would ask you, um, especially the children, please just look and don't, don't touch. <laughs> the, uh, especially the, the glass items are very, very valuable and irreplaceable. So I just really appreciate these, these, this uh, presentation, Ms. Jones. Well, in, in closing, I guess uh, I wanted to, get, again, Give my thanks to, to Ms. Mary Ellen Jones, Jeff Howe for the presentations. I want to thank uh, the, the board members that served in the previous year. Uh, Devon Reed's not here. I want to give a special thanks to him, but he's, he's not here. Well, we thank him personally. Um, Patty, thanks for coming out, representing the Wiley paper. Thank you also. You're you're very involved. You're involved in the uh, chamber, and we really appreciate. Uh, they've done, as well as the Ball Fest Committee are involved in a great donation. We want to thank our musicians who are going to come and be playing for us uh, during our after we adjourn the Four Seasons. We have uh, the violinists, Mr. James Gallagher, and uh, Hope Beeman, Viola, Emily Head, and the cello, oh, what's his name, I mean, uh, Jedediah. <laughs> <laughs> they'll be playing for us as we uh, as we adjourn for refreshments. We'll also have uh, the tape playing from last from last year's meeting, and uh, we'll turn off this thing. Uh, and are there any any questions or any comments or anything anybody would like to say before I, I entertain a motion for adjournment? Did you have? Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, I think requesting special refreshments, but uh, now you know how the Germans are, right? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion by Mr. Joe Stone to adjourn the uh, 2001 annual meeting. Is there a second? Second. By Mr. Bob Jones. That's the same time as Mr. Ledbetter. And I uh, saw your hand go up too, Mrs. Head. Did you have a comment? Very well. We stand adjourned. Uh, enjoy your. <laughs> Enjoy the fellowship refreshments. Uh, I think I think uh, Mary wants to take some pictures. I need the board. Okay. The newly elected board, you'd like to take pictures of us. Uh, oh, oh, oh.
will be the Monday the 27th at 7 o'clock. And that public hearing will be to take citizen input and comments about uh, changing zoning to uh, allow the museum and public building and ultimately to get a special use permit for outside display of uh, all artifacts. And other uh, than that, let me see, make sure I check out everything here. I appreciate everyone coming out today. Uh, we have in the back again, we have the calendars for sale for dollars each, up here for $10. T-shirts for $7.50, coverlets $39.95. We have some of the items donated on display. We will have refreshments back at this table. Uh, a couple of aerial photographs that are always fun to look at. The books that have been donating, that have been donated to the Historical Society. It's been the, uh, the essays that were part of the contest that will be fun to look at. The Highway 78 project. Of course, the House of Stolfers pocket watch collection, please do not touch, just look. And, uh, We'll have a, uh, over here some information about the Ares Fox fire engine and a short videotape also going, so now the fun part. Do I hear a motion for adjournment? Mm -hmm. Is there any, any other business, first of all, anybody wants to bring up? Move adjourn. Motion to adjourn by Mr. former Mayor Pro Tem, Mr. Bob Jones. And uh, I guess we can have a second for that.
position.
Not I'll entertain a motion to close the nominations. Got a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Got a motion and a second. I'll entertain a motion now to approve the slate of candidates by acclamation. Got a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We now have a new set of officers and directors, and we appreciate that. At this time, uh, our second item of business would be the historical marker plaques donated by Mary Eileen Jones and dedicated to J.K. Saxe. We have in our cemetery a historical marker noting the uh, historical significance of the Saxe Cemetery. What we didn't have was any little markers on the highway to let people know that there are in this city a historical marker. So Ms. Mary Eileen Jones has donated some plaques to be placed on city limit signs and signs around town, let people that come through on Highway 78 know that there is a historical, society, uh, historical marker in the city. Mary, would you like to come say a word or two about this and your dedication? Oh. <laughs> 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 I, I had planned on a center playing this game during the talk. I would Get like there, to so you're on camera. <laughs> I would like to give Molly Grissom, who is here today, credit that she's never received before. She was the guiding influence that uh, directed the Saxe family and the daughters of the Republic of Texas to uh, install the historical marker and Mary Kelso, who is also here today with uh, the Cemetery Association, also have a great deal with that. And I'm sure many others that I don't particularly know about. Uh, it had bothered me that the historical society is here and that people passed up and down Highway 78 or maybe even residents in our city didn't know that it existed. And I said, we need to do something to have some visibility. And if we could get the state of Texas uh, markers attached to the city limit signs, plus a group of pointers pointing to the historical marker, then at least people would know that we're not only here now, but that this city has been here since 1845. So I did want to thank Molly Grissom and Mary Kelso and others that helped with uh, the initial sign. I did want to give my part in this as a dedication to J.K. Saxe, he was the fifth son of William and Martha Frost Saxe. <coughs> he was as altruistic and innovative as his father, William Saxe, before him. Uh, he was honored not only locally, but at county and state levels. There is a monument in the city of Austin at the 12th grade uh, Plus Street Esplanade where the state capitol that memorializes Mr. J.K. Saxe as well as others. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. We appreciate that. It will be something visible that has come from the Historical Society. Maybe it'll let people of Saxon know that we have a historical society. This time I'll call on Mayor Larry Holden for his remarks. <coughs> well, first I want to say thank you to the Historical Society for uh, recognizing Founder Day every year and for sponsoring this event. It was 147 years ago that William Saxe first came here to, to settle, and uh, the Indians had a different idea when he first got here. They weren't too kindly for him to arrive, so he he went up north, I think, to Lamar County, and sort of pulled himself together. And a few months later, in the latter part of 18, uh, 1845, came to Saxe to settle. And soon other families came with him, and they pulled together, and by pulling together, they formed a community. Uh, we're still doing the same thing right now. In the last couple of years, I've seen the community pull together and uh, do this building that we have right here. Uh, we, got, we had enough money to get into the building. The next project was to put landscaping and uh, lighting, and by pulling together, the, the community did it again. I can only say that I think that William Saxe would be real proud of how we are still pulling together exactly as he did when he came here 147 years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Holden. At this time, we'll have our speakers uh, come and give, share their remembrances of Saxe. At this time, I'd like to have Ms. Jewel Davis come and make her remarks. Ms. Jewel Davis.
growing up in Saxe, I was 14 years old, I moved up here. And I had lived over on that hill across Rowlett Creek, went to Maine and school seven years. Had a good gravel road to work school on. Well, we moved to Saxe, moved down here on the corner. Mud road, mud yard, walk through the mud, I didn't wear mud in the toes, my hair if I didn't get there. And I was ready to be disgusted with this place. But I guess you call this a one horse town then. We had one school, one church, one grocery store, one post office, and a blacksmith shop. But it was a good, nice, close community. And these telephones up, you know, you rang. Everybody knew everybody's right. You couldn't talk about your mother-in-law or your neighbor, nobody else. You might be listening to the work. <laughs> all the roads were mud. There, if you stop down there, the corner turned on Sanctuary Road. So had to get used to that. Had a car, you didn't get to use it very much because it wasn't going nowhere. The road was too many. But uh, we had to. Everybody went to the same church, same school and everything, and everybody knew each other, friends, neighbors, relatives. And I couldn't find out it was a nice, warm, loving set of people ready to help their neighbors. And everything and at the school, when we'd have anything to do, everybody would be there. Our parents would all be there. Church be there and Sunday nights they didn't have church very much. About twice a month, I think, and Buzz Horton was the choir director. He said, You kids come on up to church and I will have a sing. So and then we'd have a party at somebody's house. But you know, we didn't have all this worry. We could get out and walk around at night or four girls and walk to church, walk to a party, and think you'd think about being picked up. People sleep out in the yard, summertime. Can't do that now. We didn't have much money, but we had plenty to eat. We said we could fix a big Christmas center and then we'd go to the store. Go out and catch a big fat hen and make dress and let smoke out and get a ham and cook it. Had all kinds of stuff to make cakes and ties, so we didn't have any worries. Happy go lucky. And I learned, I learned to love that. I didn't learn the people here, but love the people here. So I've been here about 60. Five years now, and I don't regret it a bit. It was mud and a little bit unhandy to move here. And I've been living in the same, on the same corner up there for 57 years. And I wouldn't, don't know anywhere else I'd go to live. <laughs> but, <laughs> but young people, we had our entertainment at home. They were here in sex. People let us have play parties. <laughs> Things and uh, ball games and Miss Horton was her same school teacher. And on Halloween night they let us have a Halloween party down at their house. The old ghosts and goblins and fortune teller and everything was just having a big town. But they all so I'm just happy to be a citizen of Saxe. And thank you. Question for Mr. Uh, <coughs> Davis. If not, uh, we'll we'll have a point for after the, all the speakers have for any questions and answers, and we can inter interject those at any time. I have a, I have a question. Is she related to Ben Davis? The ben Davis work? <laughs> <laughs> Are you related to Ben Davis? <laughs> he was her husband. That's what okay. I thought. Miss Ben, ben Davis. Davis. Yeah. 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 Jewel. When uh, Edith Bailey and them had their chicken house, did y'all ever get in a fight over the smell of her chicken? Did <laughs> y'all ever get in a fight over the smell of Edith's chicken house? No. Nope. <laughs> I, I, I tried to get, I I tried get along with my neighbors. Try to get along with your neighbors. That's the best way. And if we could all do that, we'd have a whole lot less fun. <laughs> had to live by and just lost a lock them. <laughs> At this time, I'll ask Brother Billy Harris, pastor of the First Baptist Church, to come and share some remarks with us. Thank you. appreciate very much the opportunity to come in this evening just to have a part of the program. I were asked if I'd come and say a few things, and I'm going to be glad to. 
It's like the uh, young man who married an identical twin. And she could be, these girls look just exactly alike. Someone asked him, one of his friends, said, how in the world are you going to tell them apart? He said, that's their problem, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> so I, the Lord asked me to come and speak a little while, that's your problem. I'm happy to be here to be part uh, today. We came to uh, Saxia back in 53. Ms. Davis, our family, some of the first people we knew, appreciate them very much. Many of you I know feel at home with me. But it's been, it's been some good years. We've been 39, 39 years. It's coming May 10th. So it's been some good years. We came to Saxony. They had no, of course, had no city water, had no, no natural drag gas. It was pretty rough back then, those days. My Miss Davis goes back so much further than I do. I, I feel like maybe kind of a young person here today. <laughs> I pastored two other little churches before we came to Saxon, went to college, and then came here back in '53. And the first year we were here, we built the first little building and also built uh, the parsonage in that first year. And ever since then, we've been seeing like building, going, doing something happening all the time. It's a very busy time for us. But uh, most, some of the first meetings we had to get some uh, the engineers to come and consider uh, bringing a water to Saxon, they were at our church. And uh, that's been a long time ago. We paid up money that everyone gave to uh, pay the engineers to come and do some of that work. So back over the years, we have a lot of a lot of members and they've all been good. I think Saxon reaches out. I, I learned to appreciate and love Saxon. They've been very good to me. So the five people, I think, in the world here at Saxon. I think that we've reached out to the youth over the years concerned about their physical training at uh, parks here when they come and play, exercise. And we feel that's important to have physical giants. The Bible says, you know, that uh, exercise is profitable little. Uh, godliness is profitable in this life and the life to come. So it is profitable, maybe not as much as other things. Spiritual giants, physical giants, we've always been concerned about mental giants and training and I'm thankful now we got two schools being built, and that's very important. And we're excited about that. But we also reached out for the people to have some spiritual giants over the years. When I came here, we have a two uh, churches here at that time. That's the Christian Church and the Assembly of God Church. And Homer Bitsang was a good friend of mine. I talked with him. He encouraged me to come very much. And I thought we needed a Baptist church here. And we uh, certainly encouraged by him. But uh, I think it's important that we realize that we need to reach out to have folks spiritually as well. And the Saxe has over the years. Now we have uh, several good churches and good pastors and a lot of partners who have made that plan. I'm just happy to be a part of it. The future, I think, is exciting. I think about the past, I think about the future. Our church hopes someday, as the Lord leads, to build, in order to about 1,500. That will be the next step. Uh, building that will go up in First Baptist. And so we have a lot of plans and very excited about what's happening. Thank you, Brother Billy. Any questions for Brother Billy at this time? Yes, ma'am. I'd like to know if he uh, if he remembers the first service that they held in Saxe and uh, like the what was the building. Where did they meet the very first time? Uh, Where did they meet for your first service? We had, we started a tent. Actually, we put up a tent, and uh, we had a week's revival. Just starting off, had a week's revival, and then the next Sunday, we organized in the church. Uh, I have some pictures here, the brochures, and had some of the pictures from things. If anyone would like to see them, look at them. You'll find. Uh, but we were in a tent just long enough to get that first building. Any other questions? What year was that? 1953. 1953. Anyone else? At this time, I'd like to introduce our third speaker, Mr. G. H. Kilso. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I uh, am amazed that all these people are here. I, I think it's wonderful that you've come today. 
you'd read my name in the papers, certainly you wouldn't have come. <laughs> Basically, what I'm uh, going to talk about is from a from a kid standpoint. I, I, I remember Saxe as a kid because uh, I was born on uh, 1219 Caldwell Street down there in Dallas in a little duplex and uh, my dad ran a service station and uh, my mom was a, was a home, homemaker and so up here at the corner where Brian Salmon's house is so now used to be a two-story house there, which was my grandmother's house, and it's Debbie Debbie Ingram. And so some of the things I'm going to say, I don't want to make the preacher mad at me here today and, and so forth, but uh, I'm, I'm presenting this from a kid's standpoint. In other words, uh, uh, what I'm fixing to say is at one time, uh, one time, uh, well, I won't get ahead of myself, but uh, we call the Pentecostal uh, religion uh, at that time, the Holy Rollers, you know, a bunch of kids, you know, and uh, so we'd pick cotton for Grandma in the, in the afternoon, but in the evening we'd go up to Holy Rollers because they'd roll and talk, and we, we thought it'd help get the cricks out of our back, you know, the knees feeling bad. So I don't mean anything to, to hurt anybody in that regard. I, I'm presenting it from a, from a kid's standpoint. Anyway, the best that I can recall. I don't know. I'm trying to piece all this back in my mind. I guess my mom and dad had a few fights from time to time. And whether they did or didn't, uh, usually we spent the summer with grandma up here at Saxon. And uh, the Davises lived down, you go down a road from grandma's house. That, that way the Davises lived in a house down there went down this way, uh, we'd gotten a house down there that Grandma had that we lived in. But that's that's a long time, that's a long time after. Uh, we'd come, I remember, uh, Grandma had an old Chevrolet four-door automobile. I don't know how old it was. Uh, it was pretty old back in 1929 model. 1929 model. And I guess we used it to about 49 or something like that. So it, it was a good service uh, vehicle. And I guess Grandma would uh, send that car and pick us up uh, from time to time. <coughs> Other times, I think my dad would drive us out there. Grandma didn't allow any drinking in the house. And she had some pretty good son-in-laws that liked to drink, including my dad. <laughs> So they'd get out there around the cars, parked in the front out there, and they'd talk about having a drink or so forth and so on. And if they had any, they'd have a drink or two, you know, as long as they didn't do it in the house. <laughs> and so I remember one day, I don't know who was there, I remember Uncle Cleve was there, and Daddy was there. I don't know who, who, who all the different uh, son-in-laws were, but I remember Daddy saying to Uncle Cleve, well, go on and have a drink, Cleve. It'll help your wife's kidneys. <laughs> uh, and that tickled me. You know, I stuck with me. And uh, we would, uh, Grandma had an old mule named John. And uh, she let me ride that old mule. And she had a lane out of the by our house there, and you get in that lane and go down into a pasture down here, kind of where the Saxe Park is now. And the cows would be down there, and I was supposed to run the cows back up. And I cussed a little bit, and I think uh, the Davis kids all like to hear me cuss a little bit, you know, while I'm trying to ride those, uh, trying to ride that old uh, view. And, uh, yeah. I got to do that. I enjoyed riding that old mule, you know, trying to kind of run those, kind of run those, that cat, those cows back up to the barn so they could be milked. Uh, I remember Uncle Jockey one time, he took me and uh, Harold, his son, and maybe Worley too, I'm not for sure. 
and we were going to go down to East Texas and buy some watermelons, he said. And we got, I don't know, maybe 40 or 50 miles down the road, and Uncle Chuck turned the key off. I didn't know I was in the back seat with Harold and the word, I guess. They turned the key off. I heard him say, the car stopped. Of course, I knew it was stopped. So uh, I said, what's the matter? Uncle Jockey said, oh, just a minute. He reached down the seat there and pulled him out of the bottle and had him a little snake, you know. And the car started up again. <laughs> <laughs> and that happened two or three times, you know. And I thought that was real funny. I did something that I just had to do with it. Seeing uh, some of my relatives here, J.C. Ledbetter was dating uh, Helen. And I used to hang out a lot down at the Davis house because the Davises. We had a bunch of girls there growing up, you know, and they always had something going on. We'd, we'd make Moselle make polypop or something. I don't know. It was just whatever we, whatever was going on, I'd, I'd like to be around there. And so, uh, I don't know how I talked Helen into it. I, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, she had a date with J.C. that night, and I said, I want to go with you. <laughs> and God knows why she let me go, I don't know. <laughs> But we went up to the little town of Saxe, and the little town of Saxe at that time was basically where what I call Worley's service station there, that thing right there on the corner where you make the bend uh, came up to Saxe Road. I don't know who's there now. But J.C. bought her a pint of ice cream. And they drove on across the railroad tracks there just a little bit toward the toward, I guess at that time, the Baptist Church. And I don't know what was there really, honestly, in that park. Well, they sat there and ate ice cream, and hell, I wasn't getting any. <laughs> so I said, well, I want some ice cream. And they gave me some, some ice cream. Finally, I think they told me I better go back to the doctor. <laughs> but why they let me do that, I don't know, but I appreciate it. I still remember that. <laughs> Other thing that I remember down at Davis uh, House, would like to say, I'd lay there on the floor, you know, and they'd all have dates coming in. I remember Cullen uh, told her coming in, dating Moselle. And uh, I, we were down there one day. I don't know who all it was. Moselle said we had some some uh, inner tubes. I couldn't swim, and Uncle Jock would always take us down there to the Rally Creek to let us swim. And uh, Moselle had a little, I thought it was a red little red horse, but the little red dog is. I think what she said was. I got to playing with it. She told me, don't break that. And I said, I'm not going to break your horse. I know that. She said, I like that horse. Don't break it. Dad would me if I didn't break it. <laughs> well, she took out after me, and man, I left like a jet. Just as fast as I could go, trying to get away from it. So. Because, uh, but, uh, and if she'd have caught me, I guess she'd have whipped my butt, which she should have done. <laughs> Uh, I remember one time back of what I call Worley Service Station down there, they had a medicine show. And uh, some guy came in in a tent. And he'd make a talk, you know, and then he'd, uh, he would, uh, I remember he got the kids up there that night, and we took our shoes off, and he mixed them all up. And then the first one that could put their shoes on got 25 cents. Well, doggone, if I didn't win that 25 cents, now you talk about being happy. Now, that was the happiest thing I ever did. I don't remember one of them. He had this medicine, you know, that's supposed to cure everything from uh, falling hair to aching toenails. <laughs> and uh, I remember his, when he was saying, he said, Blow your horn or blow your nose. I'll wait on you. He's wanting you to blow your horn. He'll come out and sell you a bottle of that elixir, you know, to take care of it. I always thought that was pretty funny. Blow your horn or blow your nose. I'll wait on uh, Going back to Grandma's house up there, I remember my granddad a little bit. Uh, grand Grandpa Ingram. I don't remember him a whole lot. He was kind of a nice looking man, I thought. And uh, he had a big, uh, Grandma had, they had lights in the house. 
course, coming from Dallas, you know, that didn't really mean anything to me, but they had these lights on the wall, and you had to turn them on and then strike a match to light. I guess they were what they called carbide, carbide uh, lights, you know. They had this old thing down in, dug down in the ground, and they bought this from, uh, I knew the name of the chemical company a minute ago, I don't know it anymore. Uh, get old as I am, you forget it. But basically what I'm telling you about is from about, I guess, seven years seven years up to about 15 or 16, something like that, you know, so that's, I'm 67, so that's been 60 years ago that I'm trying to, trying to tell you all about. But I remember the road, the road from uh, Dallas was paved, it was that old road, you know, it goes through Rally Creek and when it rained down there, is always underwater. And uh, uh, we would come out that way and uh, Alan Backus now I always was kind of jealous of Alan Backus because he lived with Randy, and he lived up on uh, he lived up on the on the second floor of her house, and he had a he had a room to himself up there, and uh, he lived there full time, you know. And I remember one time that uh, he got a bicycle for Christmas, and I guess I was there, and. Uh, he got it out here on the highway, riding it out there on the highway, you know. And uh, he'd, he'd let me ride something with him, and I'd, I'd follow him around, you know, just kind of like a little puppy dog following somebody else, you know. Uh, I was really, I was really thought that back of that bicycle was something back there. I really did. Uh, I don't even know how old I was at that time, or what, uh, or what year that was. You may remember, you remember when that was? I don't, not the back time. It was a long time ago. Uh, as uh, Mr. Harris said here, we didn't have you didn't have running water. You had a well out there in the back. And uh, I remember I was going to get rich picking cotton for Grandma. I think it paid fifty cents a hundred. And man, I never did get a hundred pounds. <laughs> uh, even when I'd cheat a little bit and slip a, a, a whole uh, heavy iron, uh, one of those little irons you know they used to iron with, they're, they're solid. I guess they weighed 20 pounds. I'd slip it in there, you know, every once in a while. And I still couldn't get 100 pounds. I never did make 50 cents. I never did. I never did. Um, just trying to think of some more. Some more. Uh, I don't remember much. I remember we used to have a post office in, 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 in Saxby. I remember on the other side of Worley Station over there, there was a, a building. A, a fair-sized building that had uh, double doors. That kind of impressed me that there were double doors to come into it. And we had a we had a, a, a postmaster there. I believe she was a postmistress. I believe it was a lady who was in charge of it. And they had a wood stove the back there in the back, and the old farmers would sit around that, you know, and, and, and sit there. But uh, I don't know when that when that closed. It didn't. I don't know what, what year that was. Uh, you know Alan Barker? Yeah, I think it was Jim Herring Stowers, is what he was. Yeah, Jim Herring Stowers. Jim that's Herring right. Stowers, that's what he right. was. John that's C. Right. was the postmaster. Who? John C. was the postmaster. That's right. That was a long time, though. Right. Right. Yeah. You're talking about Nettie, Nettie Louise oh, Saxe yeah. Harris. That, that's who I'm talking about. Yeah, that's who I'm talking about. And one of the best times that I've had when I come to visit uh, was going to the Saxe Christian Church. Uh, we never did go much to church uh, uh, at home, and uh, so when we'd come to the uh, summer and other times, well, I'd usually go to the Saxon Christian Church. And of course, like I say, being a kid, you know, I'm telling y'all from a kid standpoint, I'd always heard a lot about J.K. Saxon and about how wealthy he was and so forth. <coughs> and uh, I saw him there in church. He was there. I'm sure he was there much more often than I was, but, but he was there. And uh, he was a nice looking gentleman. He wasn't real tall. How tall was he, Marilee? About 5'10 or so? Was he close to 6 feet, Mother? I don't know, something like that. Mm -hmm. I see. But he was a real real nice looking man and uh, and uh, had a nice nice looking wife. And then later, of course, that was Aunt Molly. <coughs> And I only looked after and, and, and took so good care of during that time period. 
But really what I enjoyed at the church was that uh, was Ethel Hart. Ethel was my Sunday school teacher. And for some reason, she and I hit it off. We were, we were buddies. And uh, I don't know, she really got me interested in, in Sunday school. And I really, really appreciated everything that, that, that Ethel did for me. At that time, I didn't recognize or realize that she was Aunt Island's sister. I didn't know that. Uh, her name was Miss Harkin, and so I just figured it was somebody, you know, that, that, I, that I didn't know. But uh, it was Aunt, uh, Aunt Island's sister, and uh, I, I, I thought quite, quite many years about how nice she was to me and how, how good she was to me. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm sure I could sit here and think of a whole lot of other things to tell you all. As you all can see, there's no meat to, to any of them, but uh, they're just my recollections of what uh, what I remember as a kid coming to Saxe. I remember when Grandpa died, Grandpa Ingram, uh, they, they had him in the, in the, in the front room. Uh, so that was kind of news to me, or you know, it was at that time. And he was in the front room there for a day or two or so before they had the funeral. Was that when it was? Yes. Sir. I see. In February what year? Remember? I don't remember the year, but I was a bad day. <laughs> I see. I see. I remember, I think I remember going to the funeral. I'm not certain. But I do remember seeing uh, him there in the, in the uh, living room. I remember... Uh, Somebody telling me where J.K. Saxe lived, and uh, he lived up there uh, at, the, at the corner up there. I don't remember that. What's that address? You remember that? Oh, what's that? Maryland Way, 5937 DeWitt. And, and uh, it was a nice two-story house up there, a big, nice, a big, nice house. And, and, uh, and I don't know. <coughs> didn't you live there? Oh, That's what I thought. I thought you did. You lived in 37. Uh, uh, you know, I want to marry uh, one of, uh, one of uh, w. w. and, and, and Martha and Ingram's uh, boys. He was probably the best of the boys. I don't know. They were all pretty good. <laughs> they were all pretty good. You can't, you can't say that. But, but uh, uh, I can I can uh, just try to try to tell you what I remember as a kid. Uh, wish I could think of some more, but that's about uh, that's about all that I can. Everybody was awfully good to me. Both uh, both uh, both uh, my aunts and uncles were very nice to me, and uh, they uh, they all tried to help me. And, have helped me through the years, and I'm, I'm gracious for that. Thank you for it. Uh, I don't remember when they tore the house down. I guess the house was torn down. Grandma Ingram's house was torn down after the uh, D.C. Salmon and Aunt Lily uh, uh, bought it. Uh, I guess that's when that house was torn down. I don't remember when that was. Do you remember when that was? Uh, Alan, Alan might remember the name. I don't remember the date, but that's when it was torn down. I see. It's about 1953. 53. Because uh, that's what I wanted to throw out was uh, you're talking about uh, Missouri. Yeah, Missouri. Aren't that's you? right. That's your grandmother. Yeah, I called her Mark Ann Ingram. Missouri. Missouri Ann Saxe Ingram was the grandmother you're talking about that lived in the old two story house. That's right. And uh, Don Bell came by my house this morning. He was talking about the old barn that used to be yeah. across from the house. <laughs> He used to have an old big barn down there, and according to according to Brian, the uh, city of Saxe uh, burned, burned it down when they went to build that water tower. <laughs> <laughs> well, the water tower, the spark from the water tower, caught the barn on fire. Yeah. Right. We got a little money out of the out of the city of Saxe builder for that. I forgot what it was. The lane it was a precious thing that he burned down. He had to clear the thing up a whole lot. <laughs> And then the lane you were talking about riding mule down, it used to run parallel to 
It's actually right over right here. Down, you know, I've played it played and almost come down here to the library. It did. It did. It come that far. It did. It come that far. No, it came down the side of the house. That's, That's what I was thinking. Yeah. 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 You know, they had the cotton field beside the lane. The lane was just to get the cattle from back and forth from the pasture land down in here in the bottom. That's, that's right. That's the exactly the reason. The lane went all the way back and then you had to cross the road there to go to the barn. It was just a little uh, uh, now see, gravel road. When you're remembering all that stuff. You 15, you should have been able to remember what I just told you about because I was about, about, I was about 10. You were 10 a lot. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's many years it was. And he hadn't hit 67 yet. And of course, usually at my age, you can remember in the back a whole lot you can in the, in the future, you know. Well, I want to ask you a question. Did, sure. did Grandmother tell you that Rawhide and Bloody Bones lived upstairs? Grandpa said that. Yeah, they used to tell that. us that yeah. so we would not go upstairs. We'd all up there for a family dinner and they'd stay down. Rawhide and bloody bones live upstairs. And if you go up there, they'll get you. And I would tell you what, I get to the landing and run back back down. <laughs> <laughs> I want to tell you something. If you had been to Granny Yarbrough's place when she was taking care of Lasha and Angel, somebody told you that, you believe it. <laughs> and everybody that sits in the family knows what I'm talking about there. I remember something to that effect, but I don't remember the Rawhide and Bloody Bones. Bloody Bones, yeah, y'all bad stories. Mostly a booger man or something up there in that story room, I think, that I wasn't supposed to go in. Yes, ma'am. How old were you when you had that Sunday school teacher? How did I allow her to do that? How old were you when you had that Sunday school teacher? Gosh, I don't remember. Oh, I got something else to tell you about the church. Uh, I really don't. I guess I was probably eight or ten, something like that. I was small. I wasn't too, I wasn't too, uh, too old. Might have been twelve. I don't really remember. What she taught the youngest uh, students, didn't she? Ain't gone with? Didn't, didn't. She talked there for days. She talked small ones mostly. Did she? And she talked to growing some for years. I can tell you one thing. She said when you were a little boy, she told this when she was 100 years old. She told your mother one day, "That's the smartest child I've ever taught." So <laughs> you've made this, you've made it come true. <laughs> she was she was certainly nice to me. I wanted to tell you one other thing that the lady here reminded me of. I, I like to say, you know. I don't go to church a whole lot. And I was up there as a kid, and uh, they had communion that day at the Saxon Christian Church. Well, everybody else got in line, you know, to get a little grape juice and a, and a cracker, so I did too. So I got back. Uh, Grandma had, had Sunday Sunday lunch every, every Sunday. We always had fried chicken. And She'd always have a big house full, and usually the kids had to eat on a side table or, or something like that, or maybe eat in another room. There were so many people there. But I got to tell them about my having communion at the church. And I was told that I wasn't a member and I wasn't supposed to do that. And I said, well, I enjoyed it anyway. I thought it was a lot, a lot of fun. But after, after being condemned about it, I guess that made me not forget it. So I just happened to, just happened to remember that. But I always felt like that uh, that I learned my religion from here in Saxony, and that I uh, that I was uh, was actually a, a member of the Christian Church. You know that I felt that way because that was basically the, uh, the spiritual upbringing that I had, and uh, and I think a lot of it was due to Miss Horton. I really do because uh, she was really really tremendous, and I don't know. She just made me feel welcome and. and uh, Important, and I guess I just, by virtue of that, I wanted to, uh, to to repay her or do as much as I could, you know, in that regard. Uh, I'm sorry I can't remember anything else, but uh, Moselle and Helen and Willard, they back there, they can, they can tell you a lot of things about me, things that I've never even thought of. Thank you all right, for the house. <laughs> I remember when I, get, when I walked down there in the past, I tried to ride a cow back. <laughs> Any other questions from Mr. Kelso? No. Thank you.
thing we do like to recognize Mr. Kelso for, he is a lifetime member of the Saxe Historical Society due to the fact that he helped us from the beginning. He uh, did our incorporation papers for the state of Texas at no legal fees, and he has helped us tremendously over the past year or so to get our uh, 501c3 tax exempt form. And if y'all have never been through that, that's an ordeal. <laughs> we want to know everything about you, about all the financial wealth the Saxe Historical Society had, which was at one time we had about $20 or something like that. <laughs> $20.73, I think, is our, our sum total that we put down on the financial form for our worth. So we don't have a whole lot of worth, but uh, anyway, we appreciate Mr. Kelso, and i uh, like to recognize him as the only lifetime member that we have. referring to the Saxe Christian Church, I would like to say that your grandmother and grandfather would come to our church and bring your daddy and your uncle, Ray Boyd and Fred Boyd and uh, oh, Marjorie, and Marjorie Mary. And, Mary. and Mary. They all came and Ray and Fred were in my Sunday school class when we were all very small children. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, my grandparents were Mr. and Mrs. Uh, J.F. Boyd. They lived out in Pleasant Valley. My great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, was Comfort McMillan, and he came in a wagon train to the uh, area just north of uh, Murphy, and the uh, same wagon train with Mr. Saxe. So my people have been around here for an awful long time, too. At this time, I'd like to bring Mary Eileen Jones back up here and let her give you kind of an idea of the toy display she's bought to, uh, and put in the cabinet out there and kind of go through that. display this year is toys. Toys that belong to Saxe, Texas children in the 50 year period 1879 to 1929. The um, oldest toy toys we have are the dolls that belong to Molly Harry in 1879. Then there are marbles that belong to her three brothers and you'll notice they are all irregular sizes. They were handmade marbles back in those days. Uh, Iona Ingram's doll buggy is on display and it's of interest for two reasons. One, that she got it when she was only four years old and she's kept it all these years. And the other is that she received it at the Saxe Community Christmas Party. And back in 1907 and during that era, uh, every year the community party was held at the Saxe School. That was a one-room building down at uh, Billingsley and Saxe Road. The other toys are self-explanatory. Uh, I did include a few pieces of uh, baby or children's jewelry. Uh, I would like to mention the little gold earrings you will see. Again, belong to Molly Herring. When she was five years old, she was sent to private schools. There were no public schools here in 1881. Now, the private school was all the way down what is now Ben Davis Road. Uh, on the south side of Ben Davis, almost to Rally Creek. She was boarded down in that area during the week. And one weekend, she came home with her ears pierced. And her family was horrified that a five-year-old child would have pierced ears. Her daddy, her papa, Josh Harry, rode his horse all the way to Plano and bought the little gold earrings that you'll see in the display case for his five-year-old daughter. <laughs> At this time, uh, I'd like to announce that we have membership applications and renewal forms over on the table. We also have a guest book that we'd like each of you to sign. Also on that table, you'll see the book Saxe Remembered that was written by Ms. Mary Lynn Jones, which is a history of Saxe. Got some good pictures in it and quite a bit of information about the city of Saxe and how it's been formed. That book sells for $18 and they're on sale if anybody would like to purchase that. At this time, I'd like to make my closing remarks. I uh, appreciate the time that y'all have given me to serve as president of this historical society for the past three, three and a half years. It's been a tremendous experience, and I think this is a very viable organization, something that needs to be continued. At this time, I've got some other requirements that make it where I cannot continue as president, but I uh, will be active in the association, and I do appreciate all the support of the members, the board, and the officers in allowing me to serve for the past three years. 
Uh, at this time, I'm going to introduce your new president, Mr. Randy Glover, and let him come up and say a few things. Can I just add that the sales of the book all benefit the library? Okay, the sales of the book, uh, <laughs> Mary Elaine Jones' books, go to the benefit of the Saxe Public Library. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Pat. Uh, it's a real honor to be uh, president for 1992. I appreciate the speakers that come out today, Brother Billy, Mr. Davis, and uh, Mr. Kelso. Uh, <coughs> Sachs is unique in that it doesn't have a lot of uh, historical structures. Usually that's what you associate with a historical town. Uh, but we've been here a long time, as most of you already know. Uh, but it does have a very, very rich heritage, and that's what I'm proud of. Even though I don't have family ties to this area, uh, very proud of the very rich heritage that we have, uh, and the Saxe Historical Society is dedicated to preserving that heritage. Uh, a lot of things that we do as a historical society are behind the scenes that you don't see, see much of, but I guarantee you if you come to the uh, monthly meetings that we have, typically the uh, last Sunday afternoon of every month, uh, you'll be excited by just being there with people like Mary Eileen Jones and Joe Stone and some of the other members that can relate some of the things, not even being asked, not even as a formal presentation, they just kind of flow out of them. And that to me is worth the meetings right there. Uh, as Pat said, we are a nonprofit organization, 501c3, so your memberships are tax deductible. We did finally get that. Uh, and uh, I'd like to see each and every, each and every one of you back uh, next year when we have the uh, Founders Day celebration. Again, thanks for coming. This is the item on the agenda that most of you probably came for. Uh, we've had our speakers and we appreciate them. They'll be around during the uh, refreshments to answer any questions you might want to have. And at this time, I'll adjourn us to the refreshments. Thank you for coming. Society Board of Directors. Let's see, would you all stand up? Uh, Devon Reed, uh, Joe Stone, Marilyn Jones, are there others here? Mother. Oh, yes, I'm going to back here, right? Okay. And thank you all. And then, um, uh, is there anyone here from the newspaper that uh, failed to recognize? All right. Uh, I've given a special invitation to the folks at the uh, Dallas County Historical Commission at their last meeting, or any of you all here? Okay. And then um, I think uh, a group that's not really guessed, but the group that, that really the heart of, of what we're doing today is the Saxe family. If you are a direct descendant of the Saxe family, would you stand up and let us recognize you? I think you're the main <laughs> Thank you, and uh, many of you, you we see you each year, and it's always a pleasure to see you, and, and uh, we're glad that uh, uh, that we're all back together again. So, many thank you.
Thank you, Lloyd. Uh, at this time, we have a uh, two special presentations. We have members, uh, history teachers from uh, Hudson Middle School and Sewell Elementary here. And uh, for those of you, many of you probably have seen these books uh, authored by our own Mary Eileen Jones uh, a couple of years ago called Sachse Remembered 1840 to 1940. And this is probably the definitive work on Sachse history, and uh, she has graciously uh, offered that we donate uh, a book each to the uh, only schools, uh, only public schools in Sachse. And uh, at this time, uh, we'd like to recognize Mrs. Brenda Abercrombie. Thank you very much. And Mrs. Boyd, is she present? I didn't get to meet her beforehand. Okay. She wasn't sure if she was going to be here, but we will present this uh, to her. She is the history teacher at uh, Hudson Middle School in Saxon. At this time, I'd like to uh, bring up Mrs. Brenda Abercrombie, and she's going to introduce our first speaker for today, and uh, I think it'll be a real treat. I'm used to speaking to fourth graders. <laughs> you are a little larger. I want to thank you, Randy Glover, and the members of the Saxe Historical Society for inviting me to Saxe's 150 years. I also want to um, tell you, Mr. Love, our principal at school, thanks you for this book, and Tina Garvin, our librarian, appreciates this too. I've been a teacher at Sewell Elementary since it opened in 1992, and every year a fourth grader has placed in the Daughters of Republic um, essay contest. I'm proud to introduce just one of our 1995 winners. She's an excellent student, she's loved by her peers, and she placed fourth in the Daughters of Republic essay contest. Let's welcome Nicole Christensen as she reads David Crockett at the Alamo. David Crockett at the David Crockett was born in the backwoods of Tennessee, August 17, 1786. David had only five years of school before he ran away from home at the age of 13. After a few years of roaming, David returned home and went to work to pay off the debts of his father. During this time of extra money he made, he bought After a few years of roaming, David returned home and went to work to pay off the debts of his father. During this time of extra money he made, he bought a rifle and learned how to shoot for a while. His name became legendary as a great hunter. <clears throat> In 1806, he married Polly Finley, borrowed fifteen dollars and settled down as a farmer. Although he was a good hunter, he was a bad farmer. During the next nine years, the family moved from town to town, depending on his hunting skills to keep his family fed. In 1815, Polly died, leaving David with three children. David married again to Elizabeth Pat. He was appointed judge, elected to the Tennessee legislature, and eventually elected to Congress three times. Crockett delighted voters with the principal accounts of his hunting skills. Crockett was easy to recognize in Washington, D.C., where he often learned his future court. David Crockett came to Texas from Tennessee. <clears throat> he came to fight at the Alamo. Crockett walked all the way from Tennessee to Texas. When he got to the Alamo, he lived in the fort with his mother. On March 4, 1836, shells fell in the fort like hell all day long. At about dusk, they spotted a man running toward the hut, pursued by about half a dozen of the Mexican cavalry. <coughs> One of the bee hunters immediately knew who the man was, and he, with two other hunters, went out to get him. Davy and Crockett followed close behind them. Before they reached the man's stop and turned around to shoot at the Mexicans, who were very close, he hit one of the Mexicans, then started to run again. The man knew he could not outrun the cavalry, so he turned around and attacked again. Davy said, we heard to help, soon finding behind us more of the cavalry, and we could not get back to the fort. Finally, more men from the fort came to help us. Eight of the Mexican cavalry 
be killed. The man we went to say when the hunter died also. David received a wound on his forehead. On March 6, early in the morning, the, text, the Mexican army attacked the army. The battle was very bad. In that daylight came only six Texans were still alive. Crockett was among them. He was sitting holding his rifle in one hand and his very life in the other with the blood dripping from the night. General Castillo captured six people. He did not want to kill them. <coughs> he took them to Santa Ana where he asked, Sir, here are six persons I have taken alive. How shall I dispose of them? Santa Ana flew into the region and replied, Have I not told you before how to dispose of them? Why do you bring them to me? Then his officers plunged their swords into some of the defenseless prisoners. Crockett sprang to try to kill Santa Anna, and he was stabbed by a, a dozen swords in the heart and died instantly. After Crockett was killed, Santa Anna looked at Crockett's body and said, A congressman, was he? He was also a good fighter and a valiant one. He was too brave a man to be treated like a dog. Bury him with my soldiers. Then he turned and said, It is of little consequence. Burn Crockett with the other rebels. Thank you very much, Nicole. We appreciate you uh, taking the time out to read that to us. Uh, I know that those that uh, live in Saxe and those that, that have a part of the essay contest are really proud of uh, the children like Nicole that uh, excel in the subject of history. And I know it's a subject that's uh, near and dear to my heart, and especially as we celebrate the uh, the independence of Texas and the sesquicentennial of Saxe's uh, Discovery, uh, I think it's very fitting that we have a uh, young person here that has uh, shown interest in uh, history, in Texas history. Um, at this time, I'd like to uh, go over a couple of things that we've done in 1994. Uh, 1994 was uh, sort of a slow year for the Historical Society. We had a couple of uh, people that uh, were very involved that backed out for various reasons and uh, some of the things that we did, and I'm doing this by memory because I lost my notes, but uh, and please help me remember, but we participated in the, for the second year, in the Heritage Fair uh, that was held here in Saxe. We uh, uh, assisted the Friends of the Library, of course they did most of the work, but our activity in that was uh, we had Mr. Santa Claus come in for the day and uh, take pictures uh, with the children. And uh, it was not only a fundraiser for the society, but it was also a time when uh, you know, we could do a little community effort. And uh, we had a good time with that. Uh, we also participated with the Chamber of Commerce in uh, helping them purchase a community uh, bulletin board that is now in place at the Chamber of Commerce new offices that they just opened this year. Where community organizations can put their literature uh, in uh, little bins for uh, newcomers that come into the offices and know that there are community organizations like the Historical Society and uh, can get information on those. Uh, help me remember. Is there any, uh, any other items? <coughs> Well, I'll probably come up with some more, but this time I'd like uh, Joe Stone, who is our treasurer of the society, to uh, give us our 1994 financial report. Thank you, Randy. Uh, we only had a little activity last year as far as profit, and that was the Heritage Fair, which we had a profit of $44.63. And the year-end balance in our checking account as of December 31st, 1994, was $1,172.95. We're gradually getting up. Thank you. As I said last year, this is one of the wealthiest years in the historical society's existence. <laughs> we have over $1,000 in our budget. And we appreciate you, the uh, members that uh, uh, provide the dues for that. Uh, in 1995, we, the board members, have uh, did a little bit of brainstorming. We're going to continue, but 
we think what we want to do is concentrate on one or two things that we can do instead of uh, taking on the whole world of history. And uh, one of the items that is uh, dear to most of us is the 1948 Aaron's Fox uh, fire truck that the city of Saxe owns that uh, is a jewel. And uh, we would like to spend some time, hopefully this year, uh, two things, raising money and also restoring uh, that truck. Currently, uh, it's uh, in a state of disrepair, and uh, we'd like to <coughs> make that sort of a shining uh, example of the uh, city, as well as uh, what the Historical Society can do. We're also talking with, again, our friend, the Friends of Library Organization and, and co-sponsoring a uh, genealogical and photographic, uh, historical photographic restoration project. Uh, they want to bring in a, uh, uh, a person that can teach us how to write your family history or how, how to write your uh, life journal. And I think that fits in both with the library and the uh, historical society's goals. And at that time, we would hope to have a time where anyone, even if they're not going to go to that, could bring in some historical photographs from their family, from Saxe or non saxy uh, people, and at that time, we would photograph them and uh, allow them to take a sort of a restored or a copy of their original photographs. And uh, we think that's something practical that the Historical Society uh, could do. So you may not see any big bang items this year from the Historical Society, but I hope we can accomplish uh, a few things this year. I'd like to uh, welcome our speaker for today. And I'd like to say that, uh, first, I appreciate his willingness because we had lined up uh, Mr. Bill Withers from the Dallas County Historical Commission. And a week and a half ago, we learned that he passed away. And so not only was that uh, terrible news for us and his friends and family, but uh, we had to struggle to find somebody to uh, come and speak with us today. <coughs> and I contacted Mr. Uh, Bruce Winders, and uh, he was gracious enough to come all the way out from Arlington uh, to be with us today. Uh, Mr. Winders is, was a former history teacher in Arlington. He is currently a professor at uh, Texas Christian University in Fort Worth. He holds a PhD from TCU, and uh, I think he said he's lived in Texas since 1978. I asked him on the phone if, if he was a native Texan because I was trying to make sure that we got some real Texans in here, but even though he wasn't native, uh, he's been here long enough where he's naturalized by now. And uh, so uh, he lives in uh, Arlington with uh, his wife, and I really appreciate him coming out today. Uh, I think he's going to talk about today what was going on in uh, 1845 in Texas. Uh, he has spoke all over uh, the United States and Mexico on the subject of the Mexican War, and I think it's fitting that uh, during the 1845 time frame that uh, we were fortunate enough to have him. So, Mr. Winters, would you please come? Let me go ahead and say that I'm very happy to be here today, even though it is on rather short notice and rather unfortunate circumstances. And it makes me excited because being a former school teacher myself, that any time there's a community that actually enjoys history and enjoys it to the extent where they'll give up their television or their free time on a Sunday afternoon and actually come out and listen to somebody or gather together and study history, it's, it's very encouraging. I have, um, oh, the, the students that I teach are older than the uh, students you teach and not quite as old as some of us out here, but I wish that they all could write as well as Nicole. <laughs> so it's very pleasant to be somewhere where history is actually appreciated. The one thing that we seem to have in common, uh, the theme I was asked to speak about today, and your community is the year 1845. And I would be lying if I could say that I knew everything that was going on in Texas in 1845. And so if you're 
waiting for that, you may be a bit disappointed. But 1845 and its impact or its importance on Texas history and the history of the United States and Mexico is really critical. It's one of those dates that ranks up there with 1492, 1776, 1941, in that it's a date where something happens. And what happens is a chain of events are set in motion, and the United States history is different, Texas history is different, Mexican history is different. 1845, and the reason that we're gathered here today is it marks from that point, it marks today a uh, successful centennial, 150th anniversary of something that took place. And what we're talking about 1845 is we're talking about statehood. And when you talk about Texas statehood, or when you talk about Texas history, you're really talking about U.S. history. You can't separate the two. And so we started off with Davy Crockett being killed at the Alamo in 1836. What happens after the success of the Texas Revolution is that there are many people in Texas, many people who, um, who like myself, were not native Texans but are going to be Texans, people from Mississippi and Tennessee and Kentucky and such, that want statehood. And so in 1836-1847, the issue of statehood is broached. That should Texas go on as a republic, or would it be better for it to apply for statehood, become part of the United States? And there are many people in the United States that are in favor of Texas statehood, but the big problem in 1836-37 regarding statehood, and the big problem in 1845, will be the issue of slavery. That <coughs> As there are issues that are divisive in today's society, there were issues that were causing division at that time, and slavery was one of them. And the slavery issue kept Texas from becoming a state for almost a decade. What finally brings Texas into the grasp of the United States, or to the reach of the United States, perhaps sounds sort of sinister, is that you have a president, Sam Houston, who is in favor of statehood, or it appears that he's in favor of statehood. He keeps his intentions sort of guarded. And using the threat of Britain, you know, seem to be too afraid of Britain today, but at that time, the threat of Brit British intervention on the North American continent was a big fear. But using the threat that if the United States didn't pay attention to Texas, that the British or perhaps the French would, Texas, under the leadership of Houston, is able to persuade enough people in the United States to support annexation or statehood. Even with the support, the first attempt is unsuccessful. A treaty is worked out between the United States and Texas, goes to the Senate to be ratified, and it fails. And what happens is, this is in 44, is that there's a presidential election in 1844, and Texas becomes one of the main issues. Should Texas become a state or should it not become a state? There are, or I should say, there is a name that if you are familiar with this time period that you should be familiar with, uh, and that would be Henry Clay. Henry Clay was sort of the bridesmaid of American history at that time during the 1830s and 1840s. Ran for president a number of times but was never elected. And like Crockett, who Nicole spoke of, Clay belonged to a political party that was known as the Whigs. And he made a mistake, and that's that he didn't come out strongly in favor of 
annexation. And his opponent, James K. Polk of the Democratic Party, seized on that and did come out and say, if I'm elected president, Texas will become a state. So he's strongly in favor of statehood. Okay, so the election of 1840 really turned upon two issues. Texas, which we're talking about, and the issue of Oregon, which we're not talking about. But the expansion of the United States was such an important issue to many Americans at that time that Polk, the Democratic candidate, was elected. Okay, so he becomes president. And Texas statehood is pretty much assured. He sort of has his the, stole, the show stole out from under him in the fact that the outgoing president signs the legislation annexing Texas before Polk comes to office. Okay, so Texas becomes a state. And many territories have become states, but Texas and the sort of the pride that we have here in Texas of being special. In American history, it's well deserved because not every place that becomes a state starts a war. And Texas statehood starts a war. And it starts a war between the United States, which has promised protection for Mexico or protection from Mexico. So it's wars between the United States and Mexico. What happens is <coughs> that once Texas statehood is officially done, this is in December of, of uh, 45, so what happens is very early, Polk orders an army down to a place that we know as, of as Corpus Christi. And he orders this army to Corpus Christi under the command of a general named Zachary Taylor whose nickname is Old Rough and Ready. And at one time in American history, you know, we talk about Zachary Taylor, Old Rough and Ready, and everybody would say, oh yes, I, you know, I remember him. But as important as these people are, as important as these events are, they've slipped from most Americans' memories and in history books, they're really not very well covered. There is an important issue between the United States and Mexico, and that is where is the boundary of Texas. And Texans like to brag about how big the state is. Texans at that time had designs on making the state much bigger than it is today. <clears throat> the boundary all the way to the Rio Grande. Not only south to the Rio Grande, but west to the Rio, Rio Grande, so out in New Mexico as well. When Taylor is ordered by, or by President Polk to the Rio Grande in the spring of 1846, war breaks out. Okay, it's slow in happening, but war breaks out. And Congress, once they learn that there's fighting on the Rio Grande, passes not a declaration of war, but a statement recognizing that war exists. So they're not declaring war on Mexico, but they're saying there's fighting, there's war, war exists. And money and supplies are voted by Congress. Okay, now this war, which is brought on by Texas annexation in 1845, is extremely brief by American war standards. But it's very important, and it's important for several reasons. One reason is in the outcome of it. When the war is over in 1848, you have the United States pretty much having the boundaries that it has today, except for the little bottom portion of New Mexico and Arizona. But the war stretches the boundaries of the United States from coast to coast. 
so it becomes a, a continental nation. Okay, that's one of the outcomes. The other thing that the war is important for is just the personalities that are brought together and, uh, and such. The war produces several presidents, as wars sometimes tend to do. Zachary Taylor is elevated from the battlefield to the White House at the end of the war. So victorious general, he wins enough votes to be elected president. Another president is elected based on his record in the war. A president that we don't think of too much, but a president by the name of Franklin Pierce, who was a general during the Mexican War. Another soldier is elected president, uh, somebody who might be not someone you'd think of, but another president is elected, and that's Jefferson Davis. You're going to Jefferson Davis, wasn't president of the United States. Nobody was president of the Confederates.